morning and welcome to the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach here on this beautiful Victorian coastline. You Legendary event. The swell's filling in, the tide's dropping out, and it's on. Hard off the bottom, our cow drips it. Just throwing that back on. The paranoid man hiding in a shelter. The overload alone bleeding through the walls. You better watch right, we don't care what's right. You're dealing with a bus type, get caught in the crossfire. When I bust smite, it's much time. Bring out the dogs time, get caught in a crossfire. You better watch right, we don't care what's right. You're dealing with a bus type, get caught in a crossfire. When I bust smite, it's much time. Bring out the dogs time, get caught in a crossfire. Crossfire. Good morning. You're watching the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach. Morning. The stage will be set at Winky Pop for the second day of competition. Maybe to swell in the water. It looks really, really fun. Chianka, nice clean off the top. Here comes Kayo. Low tail reverse. Looked like he did it in his sleep. Big snap to drift for the rookie. He's having a blast this morning here at Winky Pop. And Dino frames up the first snap. Deep bottom turn, layback, hammer. I want to go surf. Thanks, Kolohe. Jatson Andre off the bottom. Big, powerful vert to finish. Robinson goes from third to second at the buzzer. Jatson will be surfing again today in the elimination round. David Silva wow. Wow. lines it up for a powerful finish. Wow. Barrett saw this section and just went, of course, I'm going to hit it. It's time for the opening round for the women. Gabriella Bryan turns in an excellent number, an 8.17. Oh, overhead wave by Tatiana. She's going to go for it. I hope she pulls it. Beautiful opening extension. The fluid style of Steph Gilmore. Joanna Faye, huge jam. Wow, that's fun surfing coming out of Joanne. We continue on with Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach competition. The elimination round is on. Off the bottom and grip, it slams it shut. He's warming up, didn't he? And now Sidwick. Here comes a big section, committed power carb. Here comes Fanning. Clean open face hook. Big top turn arc, looking smooth. Nimai. The 5.1 was enough to see him up in a second, and Connor Coffin's got to be baffled here. Connor, that was an unlucky loss. How's it sitting with you now? Yeah, not too good. Really important round with the mid-year cut. Connor O'Leary now, steep section to finish, and he clouts it. Fitzgibbons, tail trip to change up the flow, punches it out again. Massive. Whoa. We've been keeping a close eye on the conditions as we see our competitors gearing up for what looks like another big day of competition. So come out, come out now. All the power in the rail game. Slam up into the left. Up into a super heavy finish. Wow. Absolute textbook technique. Carissa Moore, the five-time world champion, the Olympic gold medalist.
the championship tour. I'm bummed. It sucks. Really important round with the mid-year cut. I know what I gotta do. Yeah, there's a time limit. We've never had pressure like this in Bells Beach. Beautiful scenes this morning here. There is a buzz on the steps. It's gonna be a great day, Ronnie. It's a day of reckoning. Wow. Up it. Game on. Everybody can feel it, knowing that their job could be on the line. Some veterans are feeling more pressure than they've ever felt in their career. Owen sizing this wave up, and he's going to go. He throws his hands down. We can tell that you need it. How are you feeling? A bit emotional. Haven't passed that round for a while. Nat Young on his backhand, straight up into the lip. Jack O'Baker, he's finding it here in the bowl. Jordy is going to go. No interference call. What a moment for the young Australian. Wow. Ethan Ewing holding wow. that round. All carve, all power. This is a heat for the ages. When this man's on fire, he is unstoppable. Toledo will take this wave as a victory lap. You got Zeke, meanwhile, the big layback slash. So far, so good for O'Leary. It's a 6.53. He gets it. <laughs> Here we go, John John now out the back. John John Florence, that was mastery. That was spectacular. World number one on the windup. Passion and fire out of Igarashi. Getting even louder because Fanning's approaching the ball. Oh, wow. The yellow jersey could be in jeopardy. Fanning takes out world number one. Callum Robson, the rookie, celebrates. Lohan Dino driving down the line. Ooh. Into a huge opening maneuver. That was crazy. Oh, that was sick. Oh my God. And he's kicking off here in the round of 32 with a lot of spark. Nimai's going to have a shot now. Nice layback going to the rail. Whoa. Slater out of the contest. Massive performance from Nimai Kalani Duvall. He is buzzing. Jack Robinson oh. goes to the air oh. for the alley. <laughs> Excellent score, a 9-1-7. Carrera flying into a big section, crushes it there off the roof. It's a good Friday here in Australia. Bells continues to pulse with some dreamlike conditions as Owen Wright preparing for the first heat of the morning. Nat Young is up on a good looking wall. Owen Wright surfing for survival. Belton. Oh. Wow. Owen's on fire. The back, Jackson Baker. He's a little Aussie battler. He's right on the tail pad. The dark horse always wins. This is just right in his wheelhouse, isn't it? Comes down to this sort of thing, though. The showdown in the F1. The paddle battle is on. Whoa. Philippe Toledo. Whoa. We see John Florence in the trademark layback hack. Nick Fanning, the four-time Bells champion. Look at that. Oh, oh, just gets swamped. Chloe just absolutely goes nuts on this wave. Miguel Pupo he just has such a fluid action. I want to make a project the front decks. I want a nice to car and no stress. I want more money, no debts. And I want to care less about trying to impress life. I want to make a project the front decks. I want a nice to car and no stress. I want more money, no debts. And I want to care less about trying to impress. I want to make a project the front decks. I want a nice to car and no stress. I want more money, no debts, and I want to care less about trying to impress life. I want to make a project that's on debts. I want a nicer car and no stress. I want more money, no debts, and I want to care less about trying to impress. You know, back in the day, we used to finger pop on the corner and everybody was high strung. A little bit of soul on the radio didn't hurt nobody, baby. We was jamming. So
This copyrighted event broadcast is produced by the World Surf League for broadcast around the world and may not be retransmitted, reproduced, rebroadcast, or otherwise distributed or used in any form without the written consent of the World Surf League. to the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach. Do you think our competitors are frothing to get out there? We've been waiting for the conditions to come right and improve that tide to drop out. Ethan Ewing on site. And he'll be coming up in quarterfinal number one up against Owen Wright, Callum Robson. who got the heat win of his life in the round of 16. And he's surfing on the bottom half of the draw. He's up against Miguel Pupo, Ethan Ewing. Looking to do his family proud. His mum won this contest. He just walked past her name on those famous stairs. He's been doing some incredible surfing, but he's up against a guy that is so desperate to get himself off the bottom of the leaderboard, up into the top of the top 22, and maintain a place on tour as we head to some of those key locations that could be very, very good for a guy like Owen Wright. What a fantastic day. The crowd's starting to fill in here at Bells Beach once again. Ronnie Blakey joined by Richie Lovett, and we also have a special guest with, with us, a three-time world champ and wild card here this year, Mick Fanning. How are you, Mick? Yeah, great. Yourselves? Mate, Good, absolutely mate. buzzing. We got the Busy. opportunity to have a surf, Rich. There was plenty of energy out there in the lineup, but the tide was uh, making it pretty difficult out there. Conditions were absolutely flawless. We had a light to variable offshore wind. Then it went perfect glass, and uh, Ronnie and I had a bit of a super heat. Who Still won? debating who actually won oh, that one. Rich got one back, so it's, um, what, 5-1 now? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, uh, uh, Mick, you've uh, had a little surf too, mate, and... Funnily enough, found some air. Yeah, I don't know what happened. I was riding channel bottom down what? at Ricky Pop, and uh, maybe it was just air under the channels of my board. But uh, no, I had a great fun surf. It's um, the conditions are really nice. There's that light onshore. I think we're going to in for an epic arvo this arvo. Yeah, it's going to be awesome, mate. And we can't uh, wait to pick your brain as it all unfolds. But right now, let's get the official word on what's coming our way this afternoon with Laura Anover. Yes, guys. Well, we've been down here all day. It's been a beautiful day, amazing waves. But, uh, yeah, we've been on hold for that tide. What's uh, the plan for this afternoon, Jesse? Yeah, we have. We've been on hold for a while and um, kind of thought we could get going and then couldn't. And we've been, like you say, we've been waiting for this tide to drop out and also for this swell to uh, to arrive. So we're going to have the, the, the men's quarters. Sorry, I've got a fly on me. <laughs> and um, it, it's all in on the action. But the, the waves look really good. And um, we're only going to have these men's quarters. It looks really likely that we'll be um, having fun day tomorrow which is also great but um, this this new swell is awesome and we're happy to get started amazing and the crowds are huge very exciting Saturday here yeah for sure I mean it's always awesome to be here at this time of year um, I know there's a few of my team who are expecting some kind of an Easter egg hunt from me at some stage in the <laughs> tower so you know we're happy to um, you know be back here at Bells and, and to have the public back amazing Bring it on. Back to you guys. Thank you, Laura. Getting excited and thinking about these big matchups. You can see them across the bottom of your screen here. Yeah, unbelievable. A big bounce back from the Australians too. Uh, it's been a rough 
run for them this year. They haven't had a lot of surfers featuring in, in the final series of a contest. And, and this is really where they wanted to step up. And we've got four of them in the event. Two, in fact, in the first heat. Mick, quarterfinal number one. You've had plenty to do with both these competitors. How's this one going to play out? Oh, it's a, it's such a wild heat. Um, for, for me personally, I, I love them both. They're both like brothers to me. So... I don't know who to go for. Uh, I'm not going to go for either of them. Uh, but, look, Owen's finally switched into gear. He's, been, he's had a cuff, uh, sorry, a tough um, run at the start. But he knew this was on the line. He's gone out and he's put on some really clutch performances. Ethan Ewing's been in incredible form all year. And I feel like the judges are just really loving his surfing. It's strong, it's powerful, and it's direct, which... Yeah, well, uh, Rich... Owen's had some big finishes here in the past, but maybe this is his year, mate. It could be his year, and we were having a little chuckle with uh, Darren Hanley earlier because he was talking to Owen, and I was, Owen was actually saying that you've knocked him out of the last four Bills events. No, and yeah. Then, yeah. Well, four quarters well, that he's four made. Four quarters that he's made. You've been uh, the roadblock, mate. <laughs> you were the <laughs> one that was stopping him. So and then we were kind of saying, well, you know, in Ethan Ewing, he's, he's kind of got Mick Fanning 2.0 right here to deal with because it's, uh, you know, and uh, Darren was saying, and he's actually on uh, your board model. So it's uh, the next best thing to Mick Fanning, uh, but certainly going to be an amazing matchup. And uh, wow, these two guys have just been in such fine form all event. Yeah, Ethan's you know, almost swap roles with Owen in a way. Uh, he was sort of languishing down the back end of the ratings uh, formerly oh, no. as a championship tour surfer when Owen was, was ruling up top. And now Ethan, the, the front running Australian on the leaderboard at the moment with a big opportunity to, here to, to climb up towards that final five. Yeah, I think Ethan, Ethan's found a lot of confidence in, in the last year or so. Um, I think having a lot of time in Hawaii with uh, Griffin and Seth, they're those three have been really pushing each other and I think seeing Griffin win in Portugal, it's really fired Ethan up. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, I can do this. Where Owen, on the other hand, he's been in the finals before. He knows big results when he needs them. That's a really good point. I mean, you were lucky enough to come onto the CT and, and be travelling and sparring with your friends, whereas Ethan came on as such a, a grama initially and, and now he's sort of found his pack that he likes to hang out with. He's in a happy place. His surfing's gone just to a, a level that I think on the rail is, you know, maybe we haven't even seen before. His edit that he dropped over there uh, from Mexico, the free surfing edit, uh, was just one of the coolest edits that I've seen. It's a very traditional approach. He can be progressive. He's explosive. Uh, and with that explosiveness, unpredictable, but generally he keeps the rails in the water and it's just so awesome to watch. Yeah, it's just precise. It's, uh, he knows what the style of surfing that he wants to do. As I said before, when he's direct, he's not, he goes up to the lip and he knows what turn he wants to do. He's not going, oh, I've got to do an air or lay back or this or that. He's already made mm. his decision. And because of his size and strength, he's just blowing through lips and he's moving water like no one else on tour. Great to have your company on day six of the event window. It is April 16th. 16th and uh, just after 3 p.m. here and Owen Wright 32 years of age has done so well already in this contest Rich. Yeah he has and uh, he needed to he was right up against it way down at the back of the ratings there uh, missing the first event at Pipeline which uh, didn't help his cause but he is certainly refocused re-energized uh, calling on uh, Cahill Bill Warren as we've referenced throughout this contest he was actually telling me, uh, I was having a chat to him, and he goes, yeah, I'm feeling good. The equipment's good. We've made a few little tweaks. He actually made some changes to his technique and where his arms were positioned and things like that. So it's it's sort of a, a you know wow. a, a, a renewed Owen, Owen Wright that we're seeing here, and, and the uh, the results are coming. That is Kale on screen there. Uh, local boy competed in the event as a, a wild card, won through the trials one year. So uh, he knows this, this lineup really well. He knows the, the tricky characteristics of this wave. But yeah, Owen Mick, um, you know, you were a surfer that, that constantly evolved and looked at where you could find an edge. Is it hard to do sometimes to keep turning up and finding a, a new approach? It is. And it, it, you, know, you always go to the places and you know how you want to surf. I actually caught up with Owen early in the event and uh, 
he, he wanted to change his surfing a little bit. You know, he's got those big fin drifts and, and stuff like that, but he needed a, a different turn in between those so they looked a bit bigger. And um, we were just talking about, you know, sometimes just driving through on that back foot mm. and ripping the roof off and then going into one of those fin drifts, uh, a.k.a. Oki. Yeah. You know, he was the, the person that we are looking at. Definitely, yeah. Uh, been some amazing... Um, goofy-footed surfers uh, here at Bells Beach in particular. I mean, early on, the, the goofy-footers had some real success here. Barton Lynch, Damien Hardman, uh, Tom, Tom Carroll, Carroll, and then Oki uh, won in 98, and then it took a long time before we saw another backhand surfer win. And here we go, Ethan on the first wave of the quarterfinals, and straight into it. Big hammer there, drives up into the pocket. That's three solid turns on the bowl. And now whipping back and hoping that this, this wave has the, the energy to get through to the inside. He doesn't want to know about it, though. He's out of there. That was, uh, that was a really aggressive Ethan. He just swung on the inside of Owen there uh. and stole that wave off him. I've never seen Ethan do that, so he's fired up. He, he's quite a, a shy character, isn't he, Rich? Uh, he is. He's super. He, he's humble, but yes, he is really shy. And, uh, you know, he's not one of these surfers who loves the limelight, who wants to be in front of the camera. He really does like letting his surfing do the talking. And, uh, I, I, you know, it's a weird thing to say, but uh, I, I wonder whether success and the limelight and the exposure that comes with success in the back of his mind is actually has actually hampered him in the past until he's comfortable enough to go, you know what, I I'm ready for this. I think that's a, a pretty fair statement. Um, let's see what unfolded here at the takeoff, man. Good move. Look, Owen, Owen probably thought that uh, <laughs> Ethan wasn't going to do that because he's so, such a nice kid, but he just swung <laughs> on the inside and then just bang, straight into it. Um, just the aggression that he throws at these turns. And... It, you know, as you see, he's not second-guessing anything. He's just going straight in and just hammering them. And you need that confidence here, don't you? Because this is a wave, Rich, that... Have, have a look at this turn first. Take us through it, Richie. Oh, look, he's just... Uh, all the weight starting to get onto that... Uh, on the back, onto the uh, tail pad there. Didn't overcook that one. He needed to keep going down the line and set up for this second turn. This is really the money turn of, of this entire wave. Just look how deep those bottom turns are. And that trademark hack releases the fins and then gets back on the accelerator. I just love how much acceleration he has coming out of each turn. Uh, and this is a different playing field to what Owen's had traditionally in all of his heats so far, or most of them anyway. He's had that early offshore conditions. There's a certain lump in it now that's been created with this uh, with this sort of slight east, maybe uh, a nor'east wind that's puffed up. It is supposed to drop through the afternoon, but the other thing that's supposed to happen is these swells are supposed to keep increasing. Uh, the buoys way down south, they were reading quite high uh, about six hours ago, and, uh, well, they're arriving. Aggressive start from, from Ethan there, getting under Owen Wright and, and taking that inside position when priority was neutral. Now really asking questions of Owen, but he's got that priority. Owen, though, didn't have to think too hard about this one. Beautiful oh. wave. Knew that he only had that one real big section, probably to attack. That wave was kind of shouldering off a bit, and he went all out and unsuccessful on that occasion. 28 minutes remaining here, waiting on the scores to come through for Ethan Ewing. Owen Wright's going to be hanging on to a throwaway to kick things off here. Priority will be with the youngster, 23 years of age, from Stradbroke Island. Just had a very sheltered uh, childhood and... You know, always had the uh, the unbelievable talent. But it, let's see what went wrong for Owen here, Rich. Yeah, just got up a little too high. A bit ambitious on that one. And you can see, uh, you know, the lip on these waves. There's about four or five different little lines within that lip. And uh, to date, you know, Owen's been just drawing so beautifully up the top and so confident. And with this extra little bit of wind, it's going to be hard for him, especially on his backhand, just to pick that right moment. Sometimes, Mick, uh, you know, you, you start watching down the line to see what potential a wave carried. And you could see that one already starting to flatten out. So Owen made a decision to, to really throw himself into it. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, you want to get a wave 
early just to get that blood flowing and you know get that confidence going if he if ethan had two ways on top of owens one he would have been a little bit more pressure um so i think that was sort of just to stop ethan a little bit um but you know unfortunately it didn't come out but it's okay <laughs> Yeah, the edge going to Ethan on that opening exchange, that's for sure. Just uh, one of those unique situations, Shannon, where you've got uh, two surfers leaning on the same brain to uh, get prepped for these heats. It's pretty wild, especially at an event like this, at this stage of competition into the quarterfinals conversation. I had a quick catch up with Cahill just before this heat uh, kicked off. And he was mentioning that, you know, none of their conversation is about the head-to-head -head matchup. It's not about how to pin one surfer against the other specifically, but it's really about working through the processes that have taken each of those surfers to individual successes, getting them to think back on that and really rely on it. Very specific to the conditions given, you know, looking at the fact that the wind has come up a little bit, that the sets are really good but it's a bit inconsistent and so really working with each of those surfers to think through in prior heats where they've had similar conditions how have they found success and getting both of them to rely on that and that's the word in from Cahill yeah right I uh, I think that's spot on it's good advice to give because it is really about the conditions today Mick uh, how is this lineup uh, compared to, to what you competed in the other day against Kanoa when it was you know quite clean and a, a little bigger on the bowl um, yeah, well, with this junkie swell, you're sort of similar to what we, we had the other day. You want to sort of take the second wave of the set, but sometimes there can be a lot of bounce, and it depends how big the first one is. Um, you know, you, you just want that the wave actually drawing off the reef and getting that clean face, as this one's got a really nice clean face. Yeah, Owen Wright looking to answer back, oh. throw away on his first ride, doesn't quite get on the roof. With that manoeuvre, and he goes down again. Ethan Ewing dropped a 7.5 on that first ride. Super aggressive start from the youngster. And needed no time to find his feet and his wax. Just got up and started ripping into it. And yeah. um, so, you know, Owen's going to have to, to regroup here, Rich. Yeah, he's going to have to be careful here because uh, if Owen drops another big number, all of a sudden Owen is way on the back foot. And uh, he just needs to settle back in, I think try and get back into the rhythm of the sets, get back into the rhythm of this heat and uh, just get in a situation where he's going blow for blow with Ethan. Uh, he's got to stay with him here, don't you reckon, Mick? Yeah, look, he, we, we've got a building swell. We've got the tide dropping, so it should get more consistent. Um, you know, 24 minutes, that's still a long time. Well, even now in the first sort of, uh, you know, five to six minutes of this heat, we've seen plenty of sets come through. Here's Owen on this little inside track. He was streaking down the line and just late to the party on that final hit. But good sign starting off, slicing down the line. You can see there, doesn't over-rotate the surfboard, keeps the nose pointing down the line. His intent here was to get up and over that little section and uh, was just a fraction late. That's what happens with these onshore. It pushes the lip down a little bit faster. Well, thinking about uh, Owen and his time on the CT, had some big championship tour wins in some of the, uh, the heavier conditions and locations. Most of his wins have come on the, uh, the forehand. But he's certainly uh, had some big performances here on the back end as well. We mentioned that he's featured in the quarterfinals a bunch of times here at, at Bells Beach. Ethan Ewing's just had his best finish in a CT event, that semi-final at Sunset. And it feels like maybe his best chances of breaking through for that, that maiden victory, Mick, uh, on a, a point break with a big open face. Uh, he has to be looking at the schedule when considering that. Uh, Bells is a great opportunity. Sunset obviously suited him very well, but this might be his contest. Yeah, look, I, I sort of... Ethan's got those really big turns. Like, we just saw he got a 7.5. He didn't even go through to the inside. Mm. Uh, sort of reminds me of when Poncho Sullivan was on tour. He only had to do two or three big turns to get eight. And uh, I think Ethan's sort of in that realm a little bit. Um, it's it's all about believing in that point. Like, when, when the pressure starts building up, you need to score in the semi or, you know, how do you keep level-headed in a final? I think that's what Ethan's missing. Um, but it, it will come. And as I said before, with Griff winning, he's like, he's fired up. He believes he can do that because he has beaten Griff many a times and he serves with Griff all the time as well. So it's, uh, it's going to be exciting. And then Owen, on the other hand, he's, he has clutch moments. It's like 
you know, to go to the Olympics and get a bronze medal when, you know, people probably doubted him. Uh, he believed in himself. He, he knows what he can do. He knows his level of surfing and uh, he's one of those people that can really get centred and just concentrate on what he's doing, not get overawed in the moment. Yeah, he's already proving it this year at Bells Beach. He's going to be making a, a big climb up the ladder, but he wants to get into the top 22, take the pressure off going into that next event. And in order to do that, he's got to keep going through this draw. So he's keeping a, a very close eye on the conditions out there. It's our man on the spot, Kaipo's enjoying the view, enjoying the sunshine down here in Victoria too this year, Kaipo's. Oh, uh, yeah, it's beautiful out here, Ron. I'm out the back with Dometic. But one thing you can notice right now is I'm a little more wobbly. It's been a couple of dreamy days of conditions out here. We've got plenty of swell, but there is, you guys have been talking about it, there's a lot of lump and bump in the water that the surfers are going to have to negotiate. And also, there's a lot of shifting on the takeoff zone. There's a lot of wide ones coming through, and those aren't necessarily the ones you want. Uh, but with this building swell, it is a little bit tricky. Um, good signs for Ethan Ewing, however, how he's able to adjust. He's got that early advantage on Owen Wright right now with priority and lead. Mm. Yeah, I think Kaipo picked up on a really important thing there and just how shifty the lineup is compared to the other day. Rich, even when we were surfing, you, you, you could sit deep and, and think you were on a, a good one and in a perfect position and, and quite quickly you were well behind it. Yeah, this is almost a, uh, a textbook copy of what happened the other day when the swell kicked, and it kicked in a big way. There was, you know, eight to ten foot faces uh, by dark the other day. This is a, a, another repeat of that. It's a fast rising swell. It's got a lot of power in it. And uh, as you said, you know, there's these wider ones. But I don't think those bigger, wider ones are the ones they necessarily want. As Mick was saying, it's those ones that hit the bowl perhaps a little bit deeper, the medium-sized ones, and perhaps the second wave of the set where they are a little bit more groomed and the water's drawing off the reef better. Uh, and, and that was a great display of restraint shown by Ethan Ewing then. That was a decent size set and any other normal free surf, you probably would have swung around and, and caught that one. But he knows exactly what he's looking for now. Uh, and, and his MO right now is to put another big number on the board and really put the screws on Owen. Well, Owen having a, a good look at that one, but Ethan not, not buying it at all. He was happy to let that one pass. So it really has looked a, a lot more comfortable in, in the jersey this year, Ethan. And one thing that, that you touched on, on, Mick, is, you know, just his confidence building. The other thing that you, you, I want you to touch on is just the size of the kid. I mean, it's, even though he's a grommer and he's up against one of the, the biggest guys on the CT, he's super built, isn't he? He's stocky and ready to throw some big turns. Yeah, he's solid. He, he's always been fairly tall. Um, but I think over the last sort of year and a half, he's really grown into his body. Like, you have a look at his legs when he stands up on a wave. They're like, you know... Yeah, little pistons, huh? They're like big. Oh, they're massive. Uh, and he's really strong and centred. Like, you have a look at really good uh, footy players. You know, they're, they're built from the core and, you know, big bums, a.k.a. <laughs> Andrew Johns. And yeah. that's, what he, that's what Ethan's got. It is. Yeah. Big nail needs a big hammer, and uh, he throws <laughs> that thing around and definitely unloads quite a bit of power. Owen Wright is chasing uh, a score here, 5.51 to get himself back into this heat. 18 and a half minutes to go. Just so impressive with the way that Ethan Ewing got aggressive at the beginning. As we get set to see quarterfinal two hit the lineup, Felipe Toledo will be taking on that man, John John Florence. That's just around the corner. Right now, though, time for a bonsai brew break. The Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach is brought to you by Rip Curl, the ultimate surfing company. By Visit Victoria, official event partner and exclusive tourism partner. By Surf Coast Shire, strategic partner of the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach. By Bond University, official higher education partner of the World Surf League Australia. And by TAC, drive safely through the home of our wildlife. A safe drive saves our wildlife.
for a team shred on all of our fun boards. All my boards are intact. That means that I didn't charge hard enough. <laughs> I can see people through the trees out there already. I should be down there. And now it's time to go have some fun. We've got a few days off before I'm heading home. Just always being around the ocean, that was kind of like what we did, we were never bored. Obviously watching the tour and, and seeing guys like Mick Fanning and Joel Parkinson and Andy Irons, Kelly, all those guys is kind of what's inspired me and made me want to go for it. It's really good to be back in Australia and competing here. It's right at the top of my list of events I want to do well at. All my heroes kind of growing up, they've all won it here and if you're surfing well here and you're winning events, it's a huge statement. I feel like my surfing's kind of been at a pretty high level. Obviously style matters to me. When people say that I have a great style or whatever, that, that's a huge compliment. I want to go more towards the aggressive side as well. After seeing Griff get his, his first win with the, the 10 point ride, it's definitely pushed me and, and made me want to want it more. And to do it in Australia would be the ultimate goal. Fifteen and a half minutes remaining here in quarterfinal heat number one. Ethan Ewing has the edge on Owen right at the moment. But Owen having a look at one now, and it looks like a pretty decent wave. He's had a couple of falls already, but he plants that first floater nicely. Well positioned for a big attack on the bowl. Driving up into it again. Gets a bit of release in the tail. Technique spot on. Always from Owen, just trying to negotiate the bumps in the face of this ride and clean up where he made mistakes before. On the outside behind him, Ethan Ewing gets an opportunity to put a big backup number on the board. Rebounds off the foam there. Nice end section hit. And he'll duck under that one. So a good exchange from the competitors with just under 15 minutes to go. Who's going to get the edge here, Mick? Uh, just by looking at that footage, I think Ethan probably got the edge. Owen got stuck a couple of little times, but in saying that, I think that was a good seller for Owen, you know, just to make a wave. It pumped the confidence up a bit. He'll probably get on the ski, get back out first and have priority, so then it'll be, uh, yeah, time to, to smash a couple more. <laughs> what have you made of the, the form of these two surfers as they get set for quarterfinal number two? Uh, John John Florence, Felipe Toledo dropping big numbers through the contest so far. Absolutely phenomenal. Um, you know, John, John's just been so strong. You know, anything from four foot and above, John is just incredible. He's so strong, he's so confident. The board that he rides, he rides pretty much every day in Hawaii, so he's confident there. But then Philippe on the other side, he's got the speed. He's got a little bit more sort of charisma into it and uh, a bit more excitement. I think the big test for Philippe was when Mikey Wright dropped some big numbers on him early and he just came back and just put it into another gear and then went absolutely loony. So the confidence that Philippe's got is, you know, John might get ahead of him early, but I wouldn't... I, I, you never cancel out Philippe Toledo. He's so gnarly. Especially with this wind as well. It's just tailor-made for that big air that he does. Uh, not to say that John doesn't do some of the biggest airs in the world. Oh, yeah. But, uh, I, I talk to Mick about John doing big airs at Melts. <laughs> the nightmare. Looking into the beach, Mick, when you're holding a good lead and just see him fly through the air. <laughs> He's doing his thing. Oh, but uh, that is going to be an unbelievable clash. These two guys are really battling it out for that yellow jersey. Felipe Toledo has assumed it for the moment, but uh, until that heats over, he's just a caretaker, and we'll see uh, a replay now of Owen's last ride. What a great floater to get started, Rich. Yeah, it, it was a great floater, but just a little moment where he got caught off the bottom, and then on the second turn, just got stuck up in the lip, so Owen just just having a little bit of problem with uh, a little bit of trouble with negotiating through these bumps up high in the, uh, in the uh, lip of the wave there, but he finishes well connected on that last turn and here's Ethan on the replay Mick this was a seven point ride so he did win the exchange yeah you see how strong Ethan is especially in these turns like he just drives straight through the bump where other people get a little bit caught and he's his timing and where he's placing these turns is really nice but being the second wave of the set he had that cleaner canvas 
Both guys are really strong. Both have incredible technique and get nice and low to their board. But is, is there an advantage being on your forehand and just seeing where those creases and bumps are coming up? I think you've just got little... Uh, you probably got a few more weapons. Uh, you can change your shot a little easier than on your backhand, and as we see Owen here. Up again, a five on his last ride. There's a better turn. Hooks it beautifully in the pocket. A well-timed hit back out in front now, lining up this last section, driving up into it now. And just rides out of that foam, and that'll be his best ride. Yeah, that's a better way for Owen Wright. You could just tell the momentum was there through the whole ride, and Ethan Ewing outside. Nice hook off the top, just really clean style. Ethan at the moment just getting the opportunity to, to just steal that spotlight back from Owen. Each time Owen gets himself a, a decent ride, clean combination there. We'll see if it factors into the top two for the young Queenslander, but uh, Owen right now waiting on that number to come through. It's going to be an important score for him with just on 11 minutes to go. Just thinking about the, uh, the conditions, Rich. There is a, a bit of a, a predicted pulse in, in the, uh, the energy, the swell lines, as we have a look at Ethan on the replay. Whoa, up and over that uh, grindy little section, around again, just slicing and filleting this wave to pieces. Another roundhouse hook right back up into the power source. And a fourth turn. Bangs it, comes through to the inside, finishes well. Five-turn five, uh, five turn combo, and he liked it. Mick, you just touched on it. I, I mean, on the forehand, maybe the opportunity to change up your, your approach, your shot at the lip. And Ethan showed so much variation on this wave and was super aggressive again. Yeah, every turn was just that slight bit of difference. You know, going up and over, fins out on that one. And then a, that was oh. such a nice snap. Wow. Uh, you know... Some people, sometimes, as I said, you get stuck on your backhand, but this was just incredible surfing. Each three of those turns were just so different. It's like these waves are sheet glass for Ethan Ewing and Owen's kind of tripping up on some of the bumps. How's he doing it, Rich? How's he smoothing out those lines so well? Uh, it, it, it's, again, it's just that lower body uh, compression of the legs. Obviously, he's got a, a super strong core, but he's he's absorbing the bumps within within his legs, and he's making subtle changes too. When he's bottom turning, he's not actually holding the, a perfect line. He's making little adjustments in his bottom turn. Another thing to note here on the backhand. So watch when Owen goes up to hit the lip. There's a moment where he has to turn his head, and he's actually riding blind for a millisecond. So for a moment there, before he actually tags the lip, he actually can't see what he's board doing on his forehead. So watch here. His eyes are, are looking where he wants to go. And now here the head's turning. So he's not actually watching out in front. If you're on your forehand, you're watching everything that's happening in front of you. And even in the turn, you're still able to adjust and, and absorb those shock waves, uh, as you said. Still a great ride for Owen, 6.17. But unfortunately for him, Ethan's oh. just dropped the bomb. An 8.83. And that means Owen's now back in combination, chasing two waves, a 16.33 heat score total. And Ethan's just on at the moment. You uh, you just can't deny it. He, he has just been perfect so far. Three waves, all solid scores, even throwing away a seven. Laura Ever down there on the steps, just loving yeah. the action, Laura. And uh, it's, it's mind-blowing to see Ethan come on like this. Oh, yes, guys. Down here on the <laughs> iconic stairways. Didn't know you were talking to me there, Ronnie. Sorry about that. But, uh, yeah, I've got some insights from the coaches. Always trying to pester them and uh, get something out of them. But uh, the coaches, Kale and Adam Robbo, also helping out uh, Owen and Ethan, saying that both of these boys have had a equipment change today. Ethan going out yesterday afternoon with this bit of texture on the face and actually changing from a rounded square to a rounded pin, a 6-0 DHD. And, uh, yeah, Owen also going to a bit of a narrower... Uh, shaped board as well so pretty interesting there guys and uh also we noticed that owen is actually looks like he's got some tape on his uh on his right ankle uh, carrying an old injury that just seems to flare up a bit a bit uh all the time but uh kaipo getting a closer look at that out in the water kaipo what are you seeing 
Well, what I'm seeing is uh, between that exchange that Ethan Ewing on the second wave of the set, it was a bit cleaner on the face, but then Ethan's timing impeccable. And what I really saw here from the channel is the way he smashed that first turn. He absolutely collided with the lip through a ton of spray. There was a little foam that he was able to take advantage of on that turn. And uh, that was just incredible adjustments by Ethan Ewing. Owen Wright having to do some adjustments himself. We've been seeing the indicators that are coming through here for the surfers and again I talked about it earlier is the shifty lineup for both these surfers to have to deal with yeah spot on what a what a performance from Ethan uh, Owen right though not backing down to the challenge that was uh, definitely some solid surfing on that last ride but you know that there's no question that Ethan's finding these waves that are, are just standing up and, and are providing speed rich and, and with that speed uh, is coming a slightly cleaner canvas being a, that it's the second wave on the set it's um it, it's kind of been his recipe for success on his run through this contest yeah it's a bit of a golden rule out here the old uh, second wave of the set there's just a good uh, view of the tape on on owen's front foot there up and under the lip you wonder whether that's aggravated it even more but um yeah it, it's it's key wave choice is so important down here at bells it's hard. It's hard to let that first wave of the set go because it is so good. Um, here goes Owen. On that first wave again. Starts with the float. Off the bottom this way, starting oh, no. to flatten out. He's going to get out of there. Yeah, I guess uh, if you've got ankle injuries that flare up, winning through heat after heat at the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach is going to put more stress on your ankles because you've got to walk the stairs more. Um, <laughs> Even, even having a surf yesterday, Rich, after the contest, by the time you get the stairs, you're just pooped. I swear they put more in every year. But uh, it is definitely one of the, the great things uh, about this comp, Mick. Making your way down from the car park, you, you're rubbing shoulders with the fans, and then this is this is a special track to walk, isn't it? It is, it is. It's, it's like walking out of the sheds, you know, for a big football game or, a, you know, an NFL game or something like that. That's your entry into the stadium and then once you go out into bells it feels like a real coliseum sort of feel um we have like you just see the crowd too the crowd is incredible down here in melbourne melbourneites uh victorians are sports mad but on top of that there's so many people from all around australia that have come up i know there's people from south australia there's people from the gold coast and people are really appreciative of great surfing and just stoked to see an event back here at bells yeah, yeah big shout out to everyone down there on the beach in the car park watching on and also at the top car park We've probably been enjoying a session at, at Winky as well. It's fantastic to have you all back here at Bells Beach. We're loving our time in Victoria in the Surf Coast Shire. We've had the opportunity to explore that great ocean road again this year. It's been so fun. But this is a, a massive moment for Ethan Ewan. This is a guy that was, you know, struggling to crack the final series at the CT level just a couple of quarterfinals before this year. And now our third place finish at sunset and potentially into his second semi-final for the year. Uh, it's going to be hard for Owen to turn around this heat at this point. Yeah, at this point, with four minutes to go, you'd have to think that Owen needs two really, really good rides. Well, he's in combo, so he definitely needs two really good rides. And he needs to be on this next one. So he needs to turn into the best salesman in the world and try and get Ethan to, uh, to get on a wave that's not so good and then he needs to pick a good one but I, I just think you know Ian's just in the zone at the moment he's picking the best waves surfing amazing on them here we go here's an interesting uh, little moment well it's Ethan with priority mistake um, and he, he lets Owen go here drives up into it Owen doesn't waste the opportunity that's his best turn yet needs to combo it up tries to climb the roof it slaps him back down can still save this ride with something dynamic on the end section, but it's just going to fade away on him. You'd have to say that's all she wrote for poor O. He sort of needed to convert that wave, get back on the ski, and then hope you get those flurry of sets to uh, to get, you know, you jump off the ski and just sort of chip straight into one. We've seen a few people do that over the time, but... Um, yeah. I saw you move to the edge of your seat there, Mick. You thought, oh, this is maybe the, the opportunity that, that Owen needed, because Ethan might have looked back on that one if Owen got a second big turn in because uh, the first turn was dynamite. Yeah, uh, Ethan, Ethan probably could have just went that wave just to keep Owen off, like a tactical thing. Um, but 
here we go. Look at this set. <laughs> it's panned out perfect. And the good news for, for true surf fans is that when someone has a 7.5 and an 8.83 on the board and they kind of get the feeling that they're not surfing another heat today, they'll generally go all out. So let's see what Ethan Ewing can do. There's another set wave behind this. We'll see if he can get in position for it. Just over two minutes to go here in quarterfinal heat number one. Around the corner, Felipe Toledo and John John Florence are making their way into the lineup. It's a replay of the 2019 final. That's just around the corner. But Owen Wright on the inside, having a think about it. Ethan's just waiting for his little mate to join him, isn't he? He's not going anywhere. He's just going to uh, hold priority and wait for Owen to come out the back and uh, he'll just do his best to hold him off anything decent in the last minute and a half. It's a real different Ethan we've seen in this yep. heat. It's an aggressive Ethan and uh, a confident Ethan, which I like. Mistake-free surfing, mistake-free competing. Yeah, super impressive stuff. It just feels like he's settling into his place on, on this championship tour. He, he he got to 15th place last year in a shortened year. Um, it, it was high pressure, and the reason that he got there is he had a great performance in the last uh, event in Mexico. He did really well through the Australian leg uh, as well. Well, Kale Bell Warren there just uh, with his little black book, probably just writing a condolences note to... Uh, to Owen, not putting it together. He can write a little report card for Ethan. Straight A's for him. He did very well. Well, three rides and look at what he turned in, Rich. Yeah, big numbers on each and every one of them. Uh, that final one, the third ride, was just outstanding. A great heat and, uh, well, Kale, he was always going to be a winner. I think real positive signs for Owen right here at this contest, though, Mick. What a, what a huge turnaround. It just hasn't been going his way. Hadn't been out of the third round this year until the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach. And he'll be making a, a big jump, and he'll position himself well to make a, a real run at the top 22 over there at Margaret River. Yeah, 100%. Owen's put himself in a great position to make that cut. Um, and places like main break, he's got incredible surfing for that wave. But then also, if it goes to the box by far the best goofy footer out there. Yep. Yeah, well, he's he's had one of the highest heat score totals we've ever seen in WA. That was at the box on the backhand. Ethan Ewing, though, too strong in quarterfinal number one. And for the second time this year, he's on his way to the semifinals. Stay with us. Quarter two around the corner. Felipe Toledo takes on John John Florence.
Got to ring the bigger bell now. I got the small one, but I got to go for the big one right now. Big names on the stairs right here. I want my name on the stairs as well, and I want to ring that bell, so I'll do everything I can. Everything that's under my control, I'm going to do it to ring it. Yeah, Bell is such an important event on our tour. It feels good to be a part of uh, people who have rung the bell, and I hope to do it again. Welcome back to the show, and what a show it's been so far. The quarterfinals getting underway. Ethan Ewing so strong. Just a, a few rides, but all of them decent numbers. And he finished up with a heat score total of 16.33. Going excellent. And now we're getting set. Take a big breath, everyone. This is going to be a fantastic clash. Felipe Toledo taking on John John Florence. Toledo will already uh, seize the yellow jersey. But John John Florence has a chance to, to maybe knock him out of the contest here and, and go on to win and, and get in it himself. But this is going to be a lot of fun. Ronnie Blakey with Richie Lovett and Mick Fanning. Mick, uh, you've surfed against both these guys. Who's the tougher competitor? Um, yeah, look, I, I, I don't know, both of them are so gnarly. <laughs> like, John, John reminds me a bit of a, like a Roger Federer, where he doesn't show much emotion, you don't know what's going on in his head, and he just pulls out big things when he really needs to. Philippe is a little bit more charismatic, sort of, a little bit more sort of how Parker competed, really fun and, and energetic, as we see Phil paddling in this one. Getting things started early to Lado. Nice clean swoop off the bottom steep section here oh, and he has wow. the section so swift in transition through that carve and again leans on the rail hard and he hammers it big layback great variation shown already what a start for Toledo knows he needs to put the foot down John John Florence has come off the two highest scoring heats <laughs> of the contest so far and one of the highest scoring heats we've seen this season. That and Toledo's crazy. not done with this one. If anyone's going to throw something big on the end section, it's this guy. It's a clean finish. And wow. a big way to really grab this heat by the throat and give it a good squeeze. Oh, my gosh. That was unbelievable surfing from Philippe Toledo. <laughs> How about opening your, your heat with that exchange? Wow. Just every single turn on edge with so much power, so much commitment. That'll get his tail up. He's excited about that one. This thing's excellent. Oh, here we go. Here goes Johnny. Here's the answer back. Let's see what it can do. I mentioned those big heat score totals. A couple of seven-point rides, 17-point scores, I should say. What a start. Big hammer to get going. Just been unleashing so much power on his run through to the quarterfinals. And he'll need to do more because Felipe got so much work done on that last ride. It was a clean layback to slide. And somehow gets his board back on top of the section. So a fantastic response when the pressure was on. Now it might have been good for John John Mick to not have heard what Felipe's number came through at. It still hasn't dropped, but you know, that was the chance to surf without the, the pressure on, but I, I guess he would have heard the crowd reactions to all those moves. Yeah, you hear it all. <laughs> you know, um, Philippe's wave was incredible. He got four massive turns, and it looks like he's on, like, slightly longer board, mm. uh, and so it holds that rail that little bit harder, and the spray was just getting sent to the moon. Looks like he's uh, jumped off the dark arts. How was that check turn to start things off, to get him in position for that one? Huge opening arc to start things off. That thing there was one of the best carves we've seen all week. He follows it up with another one. And that fourth turn was absolutely hammer time. And then Philippe comes through to the inside. He knows right now. He, he already knows he's got a huge score. Puts a little sugar on the end of it. And uh, we're going to see an excellent score drop here. Might have to change the scale and make it 20 points. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, a good heat on paper. You know, it needs a good start, and Felipe provided that. Unbelievable turns, Mick, and just the confidence he built down the line. Yeah, like, you just saw this This wave actually stood up. It had clean faces every time he went up into it. Look at that. Oh, just pedal to the metal the whole on way through. Was, um, it, it's just incredible, and it had that cup the whole way and allowed him to just go absolutely nuts. 
This next turn's my favourite one. But you have a look at the rail of his board. It's from the nose all the way to the tail. He's driving through. This turn is absolutely loony. You picked up Mick on the on the board change, but look at that. Just he actually dug the nose in, stabbed it in there, released the fins, brought it back around under him. Take us John, this John. one, Rich. This was a huge start. Massive. Watch this first turn. Just gigantic. Comes out with uh, no room to spare as the lip just tries to chase him down. And John able to just uh, get into six gear to burn out of danger. And then a couple of nice wraps through the inside. This one stood up all the way in there. And John just knowing that he had to make a, a big statement at the end and gets a, a last little foam hit. That was crucial, that final manoeuvre, and pushing this number up. Here it is again, Mick. Oh, not an easy section to hit either, huh, Mick? How many, yeah, that, that double lip that he went at, um, that's something that he, oh, I'm not even going to talk, I'm just going to watch. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable stuff here. Toledo is going to drop a huge number to kick things off. Now looking for a good backup to put the pressure on Florence. And this wave's not really going to pan out for him the way the first one did. But on the outside, Florence again goes to that oh. layback jam. A, a more powerful version of the turn. Pushing through the green face this time, but he throws it away on a reverse there. But uh, we needed them to fall off then. We needed the <laughs> chance to gather our breath after those first rides. Unbelievable. Ross Williams, my old commentary sparring partner, he's watching on. Coaching John John Florence. Done such a good job to, to keep John's head in the game. Had, had to persevere through a, a number of injuries. I mean, it's amazing when you look at John's CT record as we see the scores coming in from Toledo. You know, it, it's, it was a tough way for the judges, Mick, because so early in a heat with such talent in the lineup, but they couldn't deny him. They no had way. to go near perfect. Whoever gave the 9 3 might have to go and readjust his score. That was incredible. <laughs> yeah. I was like 10 points. Um, Look, it, 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 you want these big heats. You know, that's that's the why you, you have the scale. It's like if they're battling with nines, then perfect. But that was absolutely perfect surfing. The big rail turns have scored so well, Rich, through the contest so far. But the, the truly great numbers, the, the ones that go near perfect, have come when someone ha has given a manoeuvre that you just don't see coming. And Felipe's the master of that. That, that fourth move where he busted the fins free and rode that slide just so controlled uh, it was beautiful to watch both of our surfers in this heat have a unique ability to take a standard carb or a roundhouse cutback and make it something special because of the extra the extra zing they put on the end of it the tail release uh, the body torque at the end of it just the critical nature of where they position their board and just how fast they can correct it it, it is amazing to watch because there, there aren't many surfers on the tour that can actually do what these guys are doing. Well, Felipe, he's racing back to the takeoff zone. He's got his nose just in front of John John Florence at the moment, but he's he's not safe just yet. An 8.43 for Florence, a fantastic response on the opening ride. Kaipo, I, I can't even imagine how much water was displaced out there. It was absolutely incredible. Felipe Toledo, with the precision that he had in his surfing, was just a beauty to watch the down carve and how he's able to connect the pure speed from Felipe Toledo. It also appears that he's riding a different board than in the last so he's made some equipment adjustments adjustments John John on the other hand pure power on that first smash on the outside second wave of the set really steep section and just met power with power it was an incredible thing to watch uh, by the way it's Felipe's birthday today so he would love a present of getting through this heat against John John Florence and speaking of birthdays I also want to wish a happy birthday to the other half of salt and pepper the WSL Strider Wazalewski's 50 today. I want to say happy birthday, Strider. Yeah, Kipes. Yeah, everyone sending a big shout out to Strider. But yeah, Toledo, he wants the gift. He's going to have to uh, earn that, and he's doing it at the moment. Unbelievable start. 9.63. John John Florence, though, you know, to his credit, really threw everything he had at his ride. Um, you know, it was pretty close on the, the spread, but it, it was. Excellent surfing from both competitors. And different surfing. You know, John John had two huge laybacks in two huge critical sections where Phil's was just pure knife's edge precision. Uh, so, yeah, look, I, I feel like they got the scale right. Um, as we'll watch. So, John just 
<laughs> Hughes takes it a little bit further each and every time he does this manoeuvre and just uh, over rotates a little bit off this foam section. Great vision here. The front on angle. Just look at the angle of the board. Again, like Philippe digging the whole nose in and able to just muscle it back out. So much speed off the bottom. Hits the lip and that uh, fluffy little marshmallow section was just a bit too fluffy. We know John is so well-rounded, Mick, but that layback jam that he's got he's got a few variations of it he can take it high and bust the fins he can put it under the lip he can stuff it into the pocket like he did just there it's a, a real world title run uh, maneuver or a run for a final five finish isn't it super reliable uh, you've been credited with a, a similar kind of turn a forehand swoop when you were chasing your your big results yeah. uh, it's a great move to have for sure Sonny Garcia had the layback drop wallet and it was the most powerful thing on earth um, and you you need that statement turn uh, if you're going to go and win a world title you need that statement turn to go all right if this is on you know I'm in form I was going to ask you though what if that's John's turn that he can really lean into on big sections when he needs a huge score what's Felipe's I think Felipe's knife edge rail surfing um, but then he's, he's got so many weapons, you know. You see him at, he's, he just did a variation of four different turns on that one wave. We still haven't even seen him go to the air yet. And he's, his technique in the air, the spins and the way he transitioned straight into other turns, that's another weapon in itself. I feel like Philippe's got one of those cupboards, you know, when you open them up and there's just all, there's knives and, <laughs> and uh, guns and, yeah. and grenades and all sorts of things. He's got all the weapons. He's got them all in there. <laughs> He's got the full arsenal, yeah. He, he actually has a lot of moves that he can lean into, but I, I think you're spot on, Mick. I think the rail surfing in these past few seasons uh, on his runs to his best finishes at the CT level have come off the back of, of really clean rail surfing. And when he needs it and he goes to the air, the, oh, that's just... Uh, a whole nother adventure just over 22 minutes remaining let's hear from our first semi-finalist here at the 59th edition of the rip curl pro bells beach it's ethan ewing with laura anaba ethan ewing into the semi-finals at the rip curl pro here at bells what does this mean to you uh yeah it's it's huge um this is kind of the top of the list of the events that i want to do really well at so to be into the semis is, um, yeah, it feels really rewarding. And, um, yeah, I had a good prep here, so it feels like it's paying off. Amazing. And coming up against Owen Wright, he's been an informed surfer of the event. You know, both of you have been surfing so incredible throughout the event. But, uh, yeah, what, what did it take to beat him? Yeah, Owen's uh, such a good competitor. I said it before, that heat. And uh, he's really smart and he's been surfing really good. I know he's, he needed a big result, so... Yeah, quarters is great for him and, um, yeah, wish him well for Margaret's. And uh, we, uh, speaking to your coaches, you had a bit of a board change overnight. What was that about? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yesterday I went to a 6-1. I was going to surf a 6-1 on my heat if we'd ran and it felt way too big and then I dropped back down to a 6-0. Oh. And now I'm on a 6-0 oh round pin. And it, yeah, it felt <laughs> good. So, yeah, um, I, was, I was happy just to kind of commit to it and it felt really good, so I was happy, yeah. Amazing work. Well, into the semi-finals, Ethan Ewing. Keep on that board. It looks great. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Surfing so well, Ethan Ewing. And, you know, when you look at the, the entire draw, especially uh, the quarterfinal matchups, you know, you've got to say that the, the top three performers in the event this year are in that top half of the draw. Um, there is some incredible talent down on the bottom side, Mick, but it's going to be hard to stop whoever progresses out of that semi-final and ends up making their way through, no matter who wins this clash. Yeah, I think those three guys have been, you know, they've been in top form since day one. They've, they've gone out and, um, yeah, you've never seen any bobbles in them uh, and they just keep rising and rising. So... Yeah, whoever makes this semi up, it's just going to be absolute fireworks. Rich, this uh, this next exchange is a, a massive one. John John's got to claw some points back uh, from that opening exchange here. Yeah, he's over a point behind at the moment, so he is going to have to choose wisely when it comes to this next set. And uh, just thinking back to uh, Ethan's interview there, just for a second, just to change course, just on the rounded pintail thought that was a really good choice just to maybe grip into the wave face a little bit more and I've noticed Philippe's also made a board chance that Ky a change that Kaipo referenced from he was on his dark arts board uh, and he's gone to a traditional polyurethane that's potentially dampening a bit of the bump and and it certainly looks like it's it's 
you know, really suited to these conditions. Yeah, absolutely. This is uh, this is going to be huge. Uh, I think we should probably pull up the uh, the replay of those opening rides at some point here. The 9.63, uh, just to, to take off on your first ride out here, Mick, and, and, and perform so well. I also just want to pay attention to just some of the the bumps he had to negotiate off the bottom, but but wasn't thrown off course. Just managed to, managed to sort of lighten his touch on that rail when he needed to. And then when he found a bit of smoother water, but Felipe's ability to just transition so swiftly up into those bowls, it, it just puts him in such a great position to then pick, as you said, what, what shot he's going to take, what move he's going to make in that, in that zone. Yeah, he's sneaky powerful and sneaky strong. <laughs> like, is. you think, you have a look at Philippe next to John on the wave, and he, he looks quite sm much smaller. John's a big kid, but ones we were talking about before in the heat before with, you know, really good, solid foundations. Philippe has that. Like, you have a look at his stance. He doesn't move much. He, he doesn't move much footwork, but he's got really good hip thrust and, um, and strength through that core. Just the way he drives through the turn, it's remarkable. All the way around, and he just that extra little bit, there's the, the extra 10% that he puts into it, we don't see that from the other competitors. No, he, he goes, he comes into a turn, absolutely rips the top of it, and comes out even faster. It's sort of like that slinky effect, um, which is just incredible. As we see John, like, John's so strong. Oh, this turn is just so critical under the lip there. And there was a couple of lips to hit, and he picked the perfect one. What would have happened if John's wave stood up the hole? Oh, yeah. Like, where would the judges gone? They would have just thrown out two tans and, went and just gone home. Yeah. <laughs> and it would have been decided on that, that this next exchange, which, you know, is still obviously going to be the, the, the deciding factor. 17 and a half minutes to go. John John Florence, 6 2. Felipe Toledo. 5-9. I mean, Felipe was just a, a greyhound when he came onto the CT, but these days, like Ethan, he's pretty blocky. He's got pretty good legs on him, and as you saw then, the incredibly uh, the incredible ability with body talk to, to rip through calves with a, a speed that not many other people have. But having a, a look now at the deep stats powered by Hydroflask, 4-1. Florence holds the edge over Toledo. Their last heat was here in the final in 2019. But plenty of uh, history between these guys. But yeah, I just think this is uh, this is such a, a classic matchup because you know two very different approaches. Even though both these guys are regular footers, richer and they have big airs, both of them. They have big rail turns as well. There's just when you start to break them down in, in finer detail, they, they approach their surfing pretty differently. Yeah, yeah, there's a, there's a smoothness uh, and a flow to John's surfing that, uh, that Philippe sort of, uh, I'm not going to say doesn't has, but, but his is more kind of faster and aggressive in the way that he attacks the sections. Um, and, uh, yeah, John, it's all about flow, isn't it, Mick? It is. It's all about power and strength. Um, I'm sort of looking at these two guys right now. They've been sitting for a while, and I'm just wondering what's going on upstairs, you know? Uh, John's got priority. He's the point behind where, you know, he sort of has to make the, the decision on what wave to go next, um, where Philippe can sort of, like, play cat and mouse, like, do you want it, do you not? And John has to make the decision to get that extra point above him on that next exchange. Yeah, 15 and a half minutes remaining here and uh, these competitors, they're, they're sitting pretty close out there at the uh, takeoff zone, Kaipo. Felipe and John John sitting close and they're actually not even looking at each other right now, Ron. Just blocking each other out because, you know, I think they realize that this next exchange could very well make the heat. Yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely going to play a, a big part. Obviously, it slowed up a little bit. It was kind of, the swell seemed to be pulsing at the start of this heat. So pressure's building, Rich, in this moment. You've been in this scenario where, where your rivals kicked off with a bang. You've got a good score on the board. And then you've had to marinate on those numbers. Uh, is it a, a stressful time or are you just begging for the opportunity? I think at this level, it's just you're begging for the opportunity and, and, it, and it sort of simplifies the process too because you know you've just got to lay everything into it on your next exchange. And 
uh, as I said, it's, it, it sort of blocks out. Okay, I, I should just surf this wave to, to get a seven or an eight. It's like, no, no, I, got, I just got to, I got to go to town. But in saying that, if you're taken out of your comfort zone and you push too hard, and that's when you can make mistakes. So it's a fine line. Very fine line. <laughs> well, just on 14 minutes to go. 14 minutes and 15 seconds. Big crowd watching the show unfold here, and there's still plenty of time for John John Florence to fight back here against Felipe Toledo. for a team shred on all of our fun boards. All my boards are intact. That means that I didn't charge hard enough. <laughs> I can see people through the trees out there already. I should be down there. And now it's time to go have some fun. We've got a few days off before I'm heading home. We Are One Ocean is an initiative led by the WSL to inspire our global surf community to protect and conserve our one ocean. This year we're partnered with Shiseido and we're working with local organisations in communities around the world where we hold our championship tour events. All big changes start with just a single step and I believe in the power of coming together and working together to create positive change. Help us preserve the future of our sport. Go to weareoneocean.org. 13 minutes remaining here in quarterfinal number two. It's a replay of the 2019 Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach Final. Felipe Toledo kicked off with a near perfect 9.63. He's been looking for the backup 2.5 on his second ride and he's just taken a fall on wave number three. And that opens the door for John John Florence, who's got priority and he's sizing up this set. And he opts to go right in front of Felipe. Let's see what he does. Fades first, up into the first section, drifts that tail over the foam. Now trying to find the open face, goes into the rotation, easily rides out of that. So giving us a few different moves on the bowl. But really, this wave's just going to be a backup to that first ride as he looks to stomp it with something big on the inside. Aggressive turn, but just gets a little caught up in the white water. Meanwhile, on the outside, Toledo up again. And he's trying to better a 2.5, but he'll need more with Florence about to drop a reasonable score. Just under 12 minutes to go. Ronnie Blakey loving the opportunity to chat to Richie Lovett. And we also have the three-time world champ, four-time Bells champ, Mick Fanning with us in the booth. And Mick, it's just been interesting. It feels like the, the boys haven't been able to, to really replicate what they gave us on those first rides again. That was a really interesting exchange. Um, you know, Philippe went that first one and came off. Uh, John's first turn, I think he second-guessed it going into that first turn. It almost came off, and then he's like, oh, now I can just throw the kitchen sink at it. Uh, so it was a really wild exchange. I think John John's definitely going to go into the lead, but, um, like, Philippe doesn't make those mistakes very often. He just didn't set that rail right. Where you watch John here, that first turn was sort of... He almost second-guessed it, um, and then it was like, all right, now let's just give it some. It's, uh, yeah, sitting there cold, sort of pressure building up. You, you, you kind of get the feeling, you know where it's going. I mean, he hit the two sections correctly or in the right place, but probably didn't get the right move that he wanted. You get the feeling it's going to be below that, uh, quite a bit below the 8.43. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, it's still, for... The regular surfer, you do a fin drift across a foamy section on the bowl, you're, you're probably pretty happy with yourself. But these guys, you know, they're at the very top of the pack. John is a two-time world champion, eight CT victories. He cleaned it up nicely with this, Rich. He did. Have a look at where his front foot is on his board here. It's about six inches from the nose. He widened the stance as he was uh, heading into that manoeuvre, so we knew what he was going to do. But... Like you said, Mick, it was just a little bit stop-starty through the entire wave. Philippe here, again, up and over that foamy section. And here's where Philippe wanted to really get going. He sort of gets a little slide, and I think at this point, Philippe's just going, no, no, I'm out of here. I want to get first priority again. So there's two ways Philippe could have got priority uh, in this situation. He either had to ride a wave and get back out there first, 
or do exactly what he did there and uh, ride the second wave, but, but jump off quickly and get back out. Real shame for John, he wasn't able to finish that move on the inside because, you know, sometimes, Mick, you, you surf a wave through to the shore break at Bells and it just goes to garbage and it's lumpy and it's tricky to read. He had a nice, big, high impact section to lay into. It looked good, the turn, but he wasn't able to complete it. Uh, it was a 6.33, so he left a, a half a point or maybe more on that inside section, but it still got him in front and Felipe Toledo now needs a 5.13 with nine minutes to go. Yeah, another interesting point on that run, it looked like John just wanted to complete the wave, but he got to that final turn and, and he went to that 50% sort of turn, like he didn't really drive into it and he came off, he didn't actually finish the wave. So, you know, if he finished that last turn, probably would have been into a 6.57 and, but, so like he, he would have put Philippe's score up to like a six or something it's sort of a little bit harder where a five Philippe can do two turns and get a five so it's 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 a really fine line and they're pushing but i think something happened on the ski because Must john john got uh priority and so i don't know if we've got footage of that or what happened on the way back around because i thought uh Philippe was out the back a little bit further and got onto the ski yeah, so. that's what i was thinking too but anyway yeah, well, uh, there, there's been a, a couple of situations like that where the ski will hang back and, and not go pick up the the surfer straight away that, that's had that, that second ride in the set. So John John's got the priority. Felipe moves to the inside. Needs a 5.13. Lining up this section for something big. Bit of a transition turn. Has a lot of speed. He's going to go to the rail. Big slice off the top. Bit of foam on the face. No dramas for Toledo as he hammers the pocket and drives up into it once again, drifting the tail this time. Florence on the outside. We've got a, a battle for the ages unfolding between these two. Clean finish for Toledo. And the crowd put their hands together. And they'll have to do it again as John makes his way through to this end section. He'll want to line it up nicely here. Looks like he's going to go for something big. Goes for the huge reverse. And it's not going to work out for him. And the race is on now to get back to the ski. Well, Toledo's sucking in the breaths. Seven minutes to go. Did he get the number he needed, Mick? I think he got the five. Um, yeah, he, this, is, this is such a wild point too. Like, do you want to be in front? Uh, here we go. Same situation as just before where Philippe's on the ski first. And now John's out, but he's a little bit further. So we're going to see if someone's going to... There we go. Well, we know that the priority quite often is decided right there on the inside. No, it's not the race between the jet skis to get back out to the, the buoy. It's uh, Felipe knew that was the situation. That's why he wasn't wasting energy and paddling out to meet the ski. They were always going to come in to, to meet him. It was the same scenario that uh, happened on the last exchange. So he was conserving his energy there and he was sucking in some big breaths because he got quite a bit of work done on that ride towards the end. Yeah, he did. He actually ripped it. But yeah, if you wanted a race between the skis, you'd have Darren Hanley on the ski. <laughs> oh yeah, had a race straight into the rocks. <laughs> Sorry, DH. Uh, but yeah, look, it was, um, yeah, Philippe really consolidated on that score. Um, it was an inside wave with uh, a really clean face. It was a bit tricky, but he got a lot of work done. Uh, and he got the score that we... And he was a little more patient, wasn't he, Rich, yeah, with that first section? You know, he, he had the wave on his opening ride that it allowed him to really attack from the start to finish, whereas this wave, it, it kind of wasn't steep enough for Felipe to lay into one of those typical moves, so he kind of built through the ride. He, he stood back on the tail of his board and and read it beautifully. Yeah, it, there wasn't that sort of rhythmic connection between all the turns that happened on the first one. He actually had to show a bit of restraint on the on the second ride here. A and I actually feel like towards that second turn, I think he was going, I'm going to just throw something huge at this thing. And then once it walled up down the line, he went, no, hang on a minute, I'm just going to surf this. So let's watch what happened. The foam hit to start things off. Right here is when I thought, oh, OK, he wants to go for something big. But the wave only let him do that roundhouse cutback. And then it started to stand up again and he started to go okay hang on I'm just going to start throwing some really solid turns at this and I'm going to bank a good score I'm going to try and take the lead he finishes really strong because on John John's wave aesthetically the wave was prettier it didn't have all the bit of foam on the face so let's watch the the replay here of John 
Takes a bit of time to get things going. Just sort of one of those half layback snaps. And again, not, not one of the big, wrapping, aggressive turns that we're used to seeing. Another little foam climb. And then at this point, I think John's going, OK, well, I, I know I haven't got huge points at the start here. I need to do something big to finish off. Throws the Hail Mary. And, uh, well, he covered some ground, but unable to just get uh, the board under his feet. How's these turns, though, Mick? These are really... Uh, just adding extras as you're transitioning down the line and keeping speed. But when you slow them down, there's still so much power in each of those turns. Yeah, so much power. That little section there where it flapped and then the, it broke on him sort of just suffocated all his spray mm. to go out the back. The judges sort of don't like that. Um, but also, too, on John's wave, it didn't draw out like Philippe's did. Philippe's yep. had that one where it just hit the reef perfectly and just was steep the whole way. Cupped up all the way through, didn't it? John's looked a bit sort of like, I don't know, like water in a bathtub sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he, he did really well. He got the big projection air, um, but he just didn't connect to that, that white water the way he wanted to. He might have been able to save it, but Felipe's in front now. 6.77 on his last ride. Now that's the goal, to, to better that number. And he knows that's not going to do it. So he gets out of there. That and uh, he, mistake. he's really put the pressure on John now because he got the jump on him on the opening exchange. Now he's put that solid back up. It, you know, it is more than a point difference in those opening scores. And that's what makes the requirement now so difficult for John Mick. Yeah. Um, look, that, that, that first point, 1.2 at the start, that's a huge huge lead but you know for Philippe to have the lead it sort of just if a proper wave comes through he can just go and surf it and just give it somewhere John's got to fight for a score mm. and so it changes your mindset a little bit sometimes you get a little bit heavier sometimes you stiffen up a little bit and you you want it that just that little bit too much um, so yeah it's gonna be interesting to see I just hope we get another set when they both get an exchange off and it comes down to where they end up on the sand wanting the scores yeah I, I, I hope we get two sets in just, <laughs> just start pulsing in now but this is uh this has been a great performance from both competitors, but it just felt like, based on the, the strength of the opening exchange for Felipe, Rich, I think you were spot on. I think he wanted to work this crowd into a frenzy. He wanted to put on the big show, and he went, hang on a minute, you, you've already got more than a point on him on the opening exchange. So, you know, uh, effectively, a six, a high six, is almost like a, an eight. Yeah. For the, the the number required so he did actually make a strategic decision there to, to just surf solid and not too high risk and get the number he needed to put some pressure on yeah it was great uh tactical surfing there from philippe he's he's really constructed a good heat hasn't he to this point and just like that we're at a minute 30 to go and the other thing that philippe snuck away see how much further he's sitting inside John? yep um, he snuck away where John probably wouldn't have even looked at that wave. It was like, oh, it's too small. It's not going to do much. Mm. And so he just snuck under and just got that, that total runner along. It's, so sometimes priority oh. can just play into your brain a little bit more as we see a oh, couple of lines. Set out lines there. rolling our way. Mick, my mind's going back to 2017. It was a quarterfinal heat. You remember it well. You put two big scores on the board. Heat score of 15.77. John John was in trouble, needing a big number in a situation like this. What did he do, mate? Uh, yeah, he turned into Virgin Atlantic Airlines and uh, flew across the world and did a giant <laughs> alley-oop. Huge alley-oop in huge conditions. It was so massive. huge. I remember going around on this ski and looking at it, and I'm just like, he is absolutely yep. out of his mind. I remember post-heat, too, you hit the competitors there and said, I thought we said no airs. <laughs> yeah. But here we go. This is John John Florence, the two-time world champ, chasing a 7.98. Big section to get started. Oh, no. He throws himself above the lip, loses contact with that equipment and goes over the falls. And that was his shot at it. What do you put that down to? Well, Ross Williams frustrated there. John Florence, I mean... The pressure was on from the outset, and he did so well to, to bank that excellent score himself. Um, there was some opportunities, but Felipe Toledo, just too strong. I, I mean, the 6.77 Rich was such a great adjustment, really good pickup on just his change in strategy. 
a very complete performance and Toledo still in the hunt for his first Big Bells trophy. Well, he's just knocked out one of the uh, the favourites down here and the form that uh, John John Florence has shown up to this point has been nothing short of sensational and remarkable and, and Philippe's been able to, to come out ahead on this one. It could have been a final and uh, we're getting all this action in the quarters. It has been a final and uh, it's been a damn good one, one that we'll remember and you just get the feeling with the form these guys are showing this year, you will be seeing them both in those WSL Rip Curl finals, surfing off for a world title. But let's dive into the Harvey Norman recap. The action came at us thick and fast in the beginning, Rich. Yeah, the tone was set with this opening wave. Philippe Toledo just 100% commitment to every single turn, showing beautiful variety, getting spicy. Kicking the fins out, releasing them, carving, arcing, slicing, and just pure, pure perfection all the way through to the inside. But John, he bounced back in a big way, driving hard off the bottom, bigger wave, critical turn under the lip. One of the best layback hacks we've seen from him. All event, grinding through, roundhouse cutback, staying with the energy source. And again, hammer time on the end section. So unbelievably strong. Uh, Mick, you, you finished off a Red Bull just before you walked in. I was worried about <laughs> you, mate. As these two rides unfolded, what a battle between two of the, the real heavy hitters on, on the CT. That was such an intense heat. There was so much on the line. We're talking about the yellow jersey, the ratings lead, and potentially a big bell. But um, they know each other so well. They knew exactly what both of them can do. And uh, yeah, this this was a very smart wave, surf wave. Um, you know, he only needed a five, and he ended up putting a, a, a high six on the board. And and this right here, you never see John do that. Oh no, that was just a, a really strange choice of manoeuvres for that for that particular section. He knew and he needed something big. Pressure. But yeah, that pressure, you know, from sitting there and yeah, just sort of, just not connecting with that wave before. I probably, maybe, oh no, it got heavy. It, it felt like it, it got heavy on him. And you, you've been there before, like when you need a big score, you just want to throw everything at it. But sometimes it just doesn't happen. Well, the, uh, the race for the final five is on for, for John Florence. Still an amazing performance from him here this year. Still holds the two biggest heat score totals of the event. But Felipe Toledo, too strong. Mick, thanks for joining us, mate. Thanks so much. Thanks so much. Still me. more quarterfinal action coming your way. Stay with us. We'll bring in Joe and Bugs for the call. I always like coming here and uh, yeah, it took me 10 years to make to the quarters. I'll be against a rookie, so I'll try to, to put my 10 years experience out there for sure. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty proud of these so it's great to be competing at home. Callum Robson, the rookie celebrates. 
It's just like my dream is to surf against the world's best surfers, so the fact that I'm doing that is just amazing. Quarter number three is just getting started. Callum Robson takes on Miguel Pupo here at the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach. Miguel Pupo with one of his better starts of his career. And it's coming after a decade on tour. Callum Robson coming out of the gates as one of the most exciting rookies on the top 34 and looking to make a semi-final here at Bells Beach. Joe Turpel with a world champ named Wayne Rabbit Bartholomew for the call, who's competed here for a very long time. Bugs were coming off a couple of big quarterfinals. Felipe got payback over John John from 2019. He's in yellow and through to the semifinals. He sure is. We're coming off with like one of the heats of the ages and one of the best of heats we'll see this year. The blood pressure is just starting to settle down from that one, Joe, and we can <laughs> settle in here. But you know what we've got here. That might have been the high profile heat. We've got a couple of sleepers in the draw right here. And, you know, just sort of slid through with some awesome performances, but not much fanfare. It's a really cool side of the jaw to really break into. Miguel Pupo hasn't really had a result like this before in his career, and he's been here so many times. His first start, 2012, you're talking 25th results, knocked out in round two, round three. It just never seemed like an event he was really gelling with until now. His backhand's been incredible. He eliminated Kolohe and Dino with some incredible power surfing and looks like we have some wave action. Miguel Pupo further south the back. Callum's wearing the red jersey and they'll let this one roll through. Yeah, a little bit caught inside on that one, but uh, that's that first wave of the set. There's still more in this. Lines, look at this new swell coming in, looking pretty strong, Joe. Love seeing this building swell, and it was worth the wait after some big holds today. We saw fireworks at the start of the heat with Felipe and John. I almost thought Toledo was going to start with a 10. A high nine, which made the difference to take out Florence. These two holding their positions. Bugs, how do you regroup uh, for a rookie like Callum, who probably had one of the biggest heat wins of his career getting past a hero named Mick Fanning? Uh, how, how hard is it not to celebrate and make sure you keep your game face on to compete and do it again? What's really surprised me in, a, in some way is the poise that Callum's got. In both his previous heats, he, uh, he's He's really held the line, and, and it's, it's been his last wave where all the pressure's on against a three-time world champion, and Callum just nailed an incredible ride, and, you know, it was just really good, solid carving. Well, interesting. Kaipo, as he's sitting out in the water, we had some waves coming through. I thought we were going to get a start. What happened there? Yeah, you know what happened. We have open priority right at the beginning of the heat, so there's a battle for the inside between Callum and Miguel Pupo. So what happened is both those surfers not giving up that inside position, pushing themselves up further on the reef. They put themselves both out of position for that first set. So um, that one rolled by. It looked like there were a couple good ones. It was unfortunate. All in the gamesmanship at the beginning of these tense quarterfinal heats. Good, man. Thank you for the inside Kaipo. And that's a big part of a lot of heats. Uh, surfers demand the inside to try to control the start. Why is that so important, Bugs? Uh, why don't they just start surfing and see how it ends up? Well, some, some people do. They like to just get into the rotation of priority and just get off to a clean start. But, you know, Bells, uh, well, we saw that last uh, quarterfinal, that first, you know, getting that first choice sometimes really worked well. Other times, uh, taking that first wave of the set is a disadvantage. As we see another wave roll through, you can see the beautiful Victorian coastline in the distance. It was an incredible free surf here on Saturday when the contest went on hold first thing in the morning. As the tide drained out, swell started really showing itself, and it was game on for the quarterfinals. Women have the day off today. First semifinal will be Felipe Toledo versus Ethan Ewing. Bit of a rematch from Sunset Beach. Will Felipe win his first big bell? Will Ethan win one of the biggest events of his career. Thanks for being with us with Surfing Royalty, a former CEO who'd made a lot of great changes for the sport of surfing. And how cool is that to be a world champion and then come into this executive office with a lot of great ideas to make the, your favorite sport better than ever? Well, look, it was a collective effort. Uh, you know, I was working with a very, very progressive board of directors, but, you know, the vision was, you know, ever since I was a, a kid, you know, I, I really always dreamt of going to the, 
uh, on a Grand Prix circuit to the best locations in the world. And throughout you know, decades of experience, I learned when the best time of year was. And it's really just, just that simple application. And then we got into the rules and regulations with the best two and jet ski and really tried to make this a, a very entertaining tour. Oh, it's been entertaining, and guys like Felipe Toledo are just enjoying all these changes. Top two waves really features Felipe to go for broke on big sections to get big scores on his birthday as well. And Toledo, always a fan favorite. Oh, and it sounds like they're well aware that he's turning 27 today. birthday performance and a lot of Brazilian fans singing him happy birthday on the beach after a dynamic heat win and it was a big one over John we know how much respect those two have for each other I remember years ago John John called up Felipe and said hey you want to do airs together make a movie and Felipe was like let's do it and it was really cool he's a surfer from Hawaii calling up a guy from Brazil saying I, I really appreciate what you're doing above the lip and I remember seeing John, he's like, I want to learn how to do Felipe airs. This is a long time ago now. I think John, it was either John or Felipe, one of them got injured on the trip because they're pushing each other so hard. And I'm loving that we're seeing them in key finals in the final series here at Bells Beach. You know, I, I came home from uh, the 2011 US Open and it was unbelievable. I, you know, John, John, Felipe, uh, Medina, uh, Kolohe and Dino, I mean this new breed of surfer was coming through, they were young guys, teenagers. I came back to Australia and I went down to the High Performance Centre and I said, hey, you know what, <laughs> you better get a bit of a wriggle on. There's a generation coming through here that are just, <laughs> they're, they're, they're landing, you know, 80, 90 percent of their airs, they're progressing, they're, they are pushing themselves and of course they came in and just took over the sport. Jack Robinson, happy to be an Australian from the West and really focused on a huge result here. He won in Mexico, but this was a common sight to see in Mexico as well. The focus that he has, the breath work and the headspace that he gets to because of that breath work is just game face, no smiles, no flinching. And he can just see the waves he wants before they even happen at times. It feels like this visualization process where he can see the wind before it happens, that's a confident headspace for Jack Robinson. Yeah, well, visualization is, is, and simulation is such a big thing in surfing. But, and the guy, the gentleman that we had in here, Mick Fanning, I, I really think he really revolutioned with the, the breath enhancement. And he was the first to really take that cross training and that sort of progressive thinking and, and the, the meditation before the heats, even though uh, lots of people have sort of done it before. But Mick took it to that nth degree. And Jack now, I think he's taking a leaf out of Mick's book there in his own way. Scrappy paddle looked like Callum Robson was thinking about getting things started. He would have been incredibly deep from where he was paddling into that wave. Still scoreless, 22 minutes to go. You know, there's been a lot of sets in this, Joe. Uh, there have been medium sets, but there was a couple of uh, bigger waves. I'm just wondering how the, the head judge would be viewing this as far as a, a restart situation. It's an interesting position to be in, isn't it, Bugs? When you're the head judge, you're kind of looking at what's on offer and they'll deem the heat should run its way through if they're missing waves if they're playing too much defense but they don't keep it a secret they usually make an announcement to to the beach announcers like sean doherty and reggae ellis they'll say hey tell them this heat's rolling they're not getting a restart here they're pushing themselves out of position it's up to that judge though if he says hey there's been nothing that they've been able to work with he'll he'll start a new clock we'll see if that's going to happen yeah, it, it is very interesting. And I mean, it, to the surfers uh, advantage in some respects, they've been medium sized sets. They haven't let a bombing set go through. So that could uh, swing it in their favor. So about another minute till we find out if they're gonna get a fresh clock, Miguel Pupo and Callum Robson. We saw this the other day, I believe it was Matthew McGillivray who caught the wave right at the 20 minute mark and it just shrunk the heat down. Unfortunately, ended up in third in that matchup. Yeah, that was an amazing one. With 20 seconds to go, uh, he had, he, he took a wave and it seemed like a, an incredibly good strategy. And that means his opponents only had a 20 minute heat. 
But then as he was paddling back out, as luck would have it, a bombing set came through <laughs> and both in the three-man heat and both his opponents got a wave. Now, there's 25 seconds left. There is one wave out behind here that we could have, you know, if anyone was going to do it, I think it'd be Miggy. You know, just with that experience, he would turn around and, and, and get this heat. But maybe they got a deal going. Yeah, sometimes there are conversations between the two. Say, hey, let's let this go and have a fresh clock. And sometimes those deals vocally have been broken the hard way. We'll see how competitive these two are. Looks like they're ready for a fresh clock, and they will get it. Head judge Pratamo Rent says, hey, we'll give you a fresh 35. Let's see you guys compete with some big stats here on the bowl. Well, well, well you know what, Joe? We got all afternoon. And maybe that's why Pertamo is feeling a little generous. You know, the, the women are called off today. This was the round we're really focusing on Saturday afternoon. So we definitely have some time on our hands. 35 minutes, fresh clock, scored on their top two. Finally, we'll get things started. Miguel Pupo setting up his bottom turn. Perfect hack there. Swinging hard off the top, but he'll get hung up. That'll open things up for Callum Robson. Callum, the rookie, that's still standing in the quarterfinals. First turn complete. Kind of has to trim around Pupo. Kind of almost got caught as well on the whitewater. Now into a roundhouse on the open face. Fades it again and looking for a solid inside track. Callum redirects real quick. This thing goes off the bottom, off the top. Callum Robson looking for another open face hook. Jams it off the lip line. Flows over the top of the end section and falls. Not as tidy as his performance against Fanning the other day. But with a fall for Miguel Pupo, he will be kicking things off in the lead in quarterfinal number three. The birthday boy put on a stellar performance to eliminate John John. Toledo's hanging out with Shannon. Wow, Philippe, what a way to kick off that heat with that big nine-point ride. Talk me through it. Oh, thank you. Um, it was definitely a birthday present from God. That I'm, I'm pretty sure that, about that. Um, I was praying right before my heat, you know, like to, to you know, start the heat really well, super strong, and then that first wave came, and, um, you know, all the praise is working really good before my heats, and uh, so happy, you know. Uh, beat John, he was definitely the standout on this event. Um, he just had, in my opinion, the heat of the year uh, a few days ago with John, and, uh, uh, so, yeah, it's always really good to beat someone like him, and um, it's good to have the knot against him here at Bells since that final that he won, and uh, now I'm really happy to get that, that one and straight, move it straight to the semis. And strategically speaking, when you took off on that six that put you back up into lead, that was a really smart heat decision. Talk to me about what was going through your mind. Um, yeah, you know, when you start strong like that, you got to put a backup score right away, especially with someone against John, you know. <laughs> uh, when you're surfing against him, it's, uh, it's always tricky. You never know what's coming on his next wave. So I, uh, you know, I was just trying to make sure I had a, a pretty solid backup score, and that's what happened. I knew a 7.9 was nothing for him um, watching his last few heats, but today is kind of tricky, super tricky to ride the wave. There's a lot of bumps. Um, so I knew it was going to be a little bit harder, but still, uh, he wasn't out of it. So I just wanted to make sure I had another score and uh, to stay solid in first place. And a big happy birthday to you, of course. How special was it coming out of lineup and having some of your fans sing to you in Portuguese? <laughs> oh, it was amazing. Um, I wish I was on with the family, my kids. Um, damn. <laughs> but um, it's pretty cool, you know. Uh, we're doing what we love here, and uh, special moment for sure. I love my family, love you guys, and uh, yeah, it means a lot to me. Beautiful. Thanks so much, Felipe. Such a big heart, Felipe Toledo. Loves his family, he's a proud father, supports his parents. There's so many people backing Toledo when he's on the road and he's doing such a great job representing himself and the whole Toledo Ohana. Felipe putting on a huge performance, just his second win of his career over John John. So that makes it four to two, still in John John's. So many CT finals. How sweet does it get when you come that close, your runner up and you get him back? the very next time you compete on the same wave. Yeah, no, it is a, it is a special feeling. And, you know, you're trying to imagine, like, you know, I mean, he, he said, you know, John had just done the heat of the year against Jai. And they watched that, and he, 
he had two heats where he had the two highest combinations of the entire event. He was looking like the man to beat. Like, the preparation to take that on is so phenomenal. Like, you know, real kudos to Philippe Toledo because he came out. He might, I mean, that wave might have been a gift. Yes, it, it stood up at, at, across the bowl. But what he did on that wave, I mean, as you said, that, if they threw a 10 on that, I would not have been surprised at all. That was a special performance, you know. The heat of the air with Joao Chianca. That was one thing. Back-to-back -back days on the post show where he's winning the Boost Mobile Wave of the Day. Also the defending Bells champ. That was a big heat win for Felipe Toledo. Into the semifinals. And remember, he's still the new world number one. Back to Callum's start. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a trippy start out. Look at this section here. It's the first time we've seen it. He had to go around a competitor. That takes a complete maneuver off the bowl away from you. And uh, it was uh, kind of a strange ride, this one. He, he, he got a 4.27, and he, he battled with this thing, and it didn't really come good until near the end where he started to get a couple of clean turns. But, you know, no uh, disadvantage. I mean, uh, these guys really needed that restart, Joe. They certainly did, and with a fresh clock, this set came right away. Pupo fell on his first turn, and Callum put up this number of 4.27. Judges keeping him honest. And then this was the fall from Pupo. Instead, this is his second scoring ride. Yeah, second scoring ride. Hadn't come in yet, but he, he needed to get something going here. His first wave was a, a pretty bad fall on a set wave. And uh, this one, he brought it through. It kept a, this wave just kept a little bit of body, and he, and he finished it up pretty neat. So he's, uh, he's definitely answered Callum on that first exchange. Whether they'll keep those scores in the end, I don't know. I'm doubtful. Yeah, looking like they'll be improving on those with a fresh clock and some great surf. That's still building throughout this afternoon and into the evening. There's a ton of options as well in the next couple of days as far as finals day is concerned. Yeah, well, we're drawing towards the final at this, uh, at this fabled surf break, Bells Beach, and it has turned it on this afternoon. We waited all day, Joe, and this new swell, it kicked in. It certainly did. As we look at the Oakberry surf conditions, five to seven feet on the face, and this is the crazy part. Air temperature, 81 degrees. That's in Fahrenheit, 27 in Celsius. That is so rare this time of year at Bells. You're used to being cold, wearing beanies, wearing the anti-series rip curl jackets. But that warm weather is creating this light and variable wind and creating some very rippable sections to definitely feature the power surfing here on the bowl. 4.83 for Lasta Pupo. He's already right back into the mix as he takes the lead off Callum Robson. Yeah, well, I think the story for both these surfers was actually way back in round three for both of them. Firstly, with Callum, you saw the emotion of him getting through that heat. He was absolutely... It was a clutch ride at the end of the heat, and then making it through that heat meant that he is going to make the cut absolutely for sure because it was, he, it was his third, ninth or better, and now, of course, in the quarterfinals. So he's sweet. And that was a, a big, you know, load off his shoulders. And I think after that, against Mickey, he kind of had nothing to lose, and he surfed that way. But again, he had a clutch ride right at the end when the pressure was on. And for a young kid from Evans Head, he handled that pressure so well. And looks like he wants to take a part of this wall. Callum Robson, second scoring ride. Chasing down his first maneuver. Healthy look in front side wrap, hard off the bottom. Nails the lip. Sets up a nice, beautiful wrapping cutback. Three solid turns, a lot smoother than his opener. And now into the end section. Jams the finish. Solid momentum as he is heating up. And the Victorian boys there, Adam Robertson, Kale Bell Warren, happy with that one. Miguel Pupo keeps the exchange alive. Blowtail falls again off the top. His second fall here in the quarterfinals. Yeah, well, Callum's going to definitely take the lead now, but uh, Pupo, you know, Mickey, he'll be out the back, so not too disadvantaged. But he's had a few bad falls in this. He's not quite in sync how he was in his previous heat against Kolohe, but Callum tends to build and get stronger as the heat goes on. I mean, that's been a feature of him during the Rip Curl Pro. 26 on the clock here, Bugs. Oh, whistles from the stairs has that new swell is right in front of our face here. Sammy Pupo hanging on the steps there, who's fun to watch in this event, enjoying his rookie season on tour. 
But it looks like he's a little stressed out right now, Bugs. Yeah, he's, uh, his brother's sort of letting him down, it looks like. <laughs> he's going, come on, man. Looking at those falls, he's hoping Miguel Pupa works it out this time. Beautiful backhand flow. Upside down on that first section. Into his third maneuver already. Nice clean top turn. Setup work to get down the line, and he'll just throw that last vert into the end section and stays on his feet. David Silva likes it. Kaiwa Belli's calling friends in Brazil, saying Miguel Pupo's getting on a roll. Yeah, and I kind of think there's a mindset in this heat, and particularly you can, I think you can see it through the supporters, where they're going, you know, we're not against John John, we're not against Philippe, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're against sort of dark horses. You know, Miggy's never got past the round, you know, the round of 32 ever over 10 year period. Callum's a rookie, doesn't know the break at all. And so they'd be saying, here's an opportunity, don't blow it. But look at Callum, a 7.67. They, the judges love that carving repertoire he's got. And, and he's really, um, he might be a kid from Evan's head, but I tell you what, he's got some serious man turns. He really does, especially that opener was solid and how connected he was in between turns was so refreshing after his start. And, and you can see there's, there's no slack in between. It's just, it's just power turns and he sets up for the next one. Clean transitions. Yeah, man. Solid performance for the rookie to get a 7-6-7. Seven, seven. This powerful rail hook took out McFanning in the round of 16. And he's got a great shot to move closer into that top 10 picture. Carve to snap combo, that's gonna be fun all day long here at Bells. Wow, such a deep bottom turn. And it's really setting you up nicely. And, and it's, you know, there's a variety in his repertoire. Everything's powerful, everything's in sync. You would think that he's been surfing his way for years. We saw him when he arrived and uh, there hadn't been much surf. And, he didn't, he didn't come down here in the junior days. I'm not even sure if he had a junior career. <laughs> and then the response from Pupo. Yeah, well, uh, he got going on this one. This is a better, it seemed like a better rider. He only got a 4.7, so probably not enough work on the bowl, Joe. And then laying down the final turn, 4.7 for last of Miguel Pupo. So still not getting out of that low range score, but I loved how cool that first float looked. Yeah, I was kind of surprised that he didn't break at least into the five point range with this. Um, one judge gave him a five five, but the rest had him below the mark. Just sometimes when someone surprises you with, with a different type of move to start and Miguel Pupo has this ability to go upside down on a backhand floater. And I really saw it re repeated in M Miguel's performance when he finished in third place at Snapper Rocks. It was that season where Felipe beat Julian Wilson in the final back in 2015. Pupo was in the semifinals. He goes so quick, he's almost doing upside down floaters. And I really appreciate that move. Let's hear from John John Florence with Shannon. John, that was a well fought battle against Philippe, but must be tough going down. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's not fun to lose. Um, uh, yeah, it was a battle. The waves are pretty difficult. It's, it's hard to like find a line on the waves. There's so many like steps and stuff in it, but um, there's waves. I'd love to know about that last moment. You were sitting with priority. You had one last ditch effort and threw it up into the air. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just like, I was going for a turn and then it just had this like kind of rib in it. And, um, so I tried to make a like kind of last second decision to try to do something else um, and kind of got caught between two moves. <laughs> it wasn't ideal. Um, you never want to go down like that. Like, you always want to give yourself like the best chance. And when a wave comes like that, which feels like never happens, you're just like, oh my gosh, okay, I can do this. Um, but it's all good. Talk to me about feelings going into Margaret River. Um, yeah, I'm super excited going into Margaret's and I, I don't know, I love it there and I've always had so much fun competing there. and so. Uh, hopefully we get some waves. Thanks so much and well done, other. John John's such a mellow cat. You know, he's cruisy, he's humble, he's kind to everyone he sees in the competitors area. I mean, that excitement, he might not raise his voice too much. I think we do because Margaret River's coming up next and we get to see John John compete at main break and at the box at Jack Robinson's backyard. But yeah. obviously, John's the guy to beat um, at, in, the, in the West. And now with this performance, even though it was a quarter and he won in 2019, that result 
getting equal fifth already sees him in third place in the final five picture heading into the west yeah it's, it's still solid like i mean for someone like john you know who's a perennial when well, a, a two-time world champion perennial contender that quarterfinal uh part of the of the draw is the bare minimum acceptable result uh so you know he wouldn't be happy to go out at his bottom level acceptability but going beyond that third's decent finals good it's great to look at all the points on offer for big wins 10,000 points on the line for a win at the championship tour level and a couple of years ago they changed the points from second used to be 8,000 now it's less than that really wanting to reward wins at this level uh, bugs how did you react to that change yeah those 10,000 points uh, uh, you know obviously the win I think uh, it's a sliding scale and I think it, I think they've got it pretty right and it's cool when you see a big victory how hard that is to accomplish oh they're not they're not it is any cts is so hard to win and so you really want to reward that even creating separation from finishing runner up in the final so a lot of things can change in your career whether it's qualifying for the mid-season cut or working out a spot in the rip curl wsl finals this september miguel pupo snap to start Beautiful tail blow. Half the board was out the back. Nice tight little stab in the pocket. Now fading. Four eight three four seven. He's over the fours. He needs a seven point one two. He'll just start essing in the flats, and he'll have to step off as he didn't have an end section to work with. Yeah, he 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 definitely hasn't reached the heights that he did in the heat with Kolohe. You know, he was definitely, uh, his wave choice was a lot stronger in that heat. His, his work on the bowl, he was really getting those, those backhand hooks, you know, really clean bottom turns, backhand hooks, multiple maneuvers. Another medium-sized wave, surf well. Gets a bit, the board above the lip line there, Joe. And then he just sort of runs out of bowl. But, it, you know, he got a couple of s slick moves in. Let's see if he can get over the five mark. He's going to need to with that 7-6-7 seven, seven by his opponent. So we'll see, he was definitely working hard to stay on his feet. A finishing section would have been really helpful to get closer to Callum Robson as he's chasing a 7.12, 18 minutes on the clock. Yeah, it seems like he's chasing a six, really. He, he seems like if he could get a six, he's back in this heat. Laura Enever, really impressive to see Callum in the driver's seat of a big quarterfinal at Bells. So impressive to see him. Callum has only only just come down to Bells uh, about two weeks before the event and uh, training with uh, Kale Bell Warren down here and the locals, Adam Robinson. And uh, yeah, he, uh, Kale just saying that it, it feels to him as if uh, Callum's been coming here his whole life. He's got this incredible wave selection. He thinks that out of all of the uh, surfers in the quarterfinals, Callum has caught the least amount of waves. He just is used to sitting out there, dropping anchor and waiting for that exact wave that he wants. So uh, we saw him do that against Mick Fanning. And look at him now. He's letting go of waves. He's being so selective. And yeah, so Kale just giving him massive accolades for that, uh, just being selective, really. But uh, going back to also the goofy footers in the draw, and uh, yeah what it takes to be a goofy footer and win out here today and uh, yeah I think you know that's obviously all wave selection speaking to Owen Wright as well he just didn't find the right waves uh, and yeah today with that bump on the face the goofy footers need to find those clean ones well Laura just quickly as an Australian yourself you know we, we see this name Callum Robson pop up globally and we start trying to dive deep into where this guy came from in Australian surfing circles was he a household name before he qualified or was that a bit of a surprise as well no, Calm's like a local hero up the coast, but uh, yeah, not a household name at all. And I think it's so special and amazing to see his rise in this event. You know, he is, he deserves to be a household name. He's obviously shown that he deserves to be on tour and taking out Mick, that was an incredible moment in his career. So uh, it's amazing to see. And uh, yeah, it looks like there's some amazing sets coming through now. So hopefully we'll just see fireworks at the end of this heat. Thanks so much, Laura, for the insight from the top of the steps. And what a role for Callum Robson. He has priority. Waves on the way as this swell is building. This wall is stretching out across the area. They are going to be out of position here, Bugs. Yeah, I can give you a bit more insight into, into Callum uh, Robson's rise. It was meteoric. He came from nowhere. It was in the 2021 regional qualifying, and it was the last event. It was a QS5000 at Caparita, 
and uh, no one had even talked about him. He was he was nowhere near the top ten. He came through and won that event. He he beat Mitch Parkinson in the final, and next that that landed him in that top ten. He went on the Challenger Series, and you know that the the beautiful thing about that Challenger Series is that it's in really quality waves. And even though it was a short and abbreviated one last year, Callum cut through that like butter. Next minute he's on the CT. Now he's had two nights and, and he's already through to a fifth and looking like he might be in a semi-final. Although, you know, Mickey's still got a, a lot to say about that. But he is really powering as, as a rookie on um, at the CT level. So much action in the Challenger Series. Just with four events last year, it was so easy to follow all the way to the finish in Haleiwa. Well, Kaipo, you've got the best seat in the house. Uh, are, are these some of the bigger waves we've seen today? Yeah, Joe, I'm out the back with Dometic, and it is really clear that we're having a new swell push in, and the swell is rising. The old swell is underneath this swell right now, and that's why you have, even though the wind's laid down, we really have a jumbled water here uh, because of these, the new swell and the old lingering swell. It, and it's also making it really difficult for these guys to find their mark out there. They've been out of position a couple of times. Here we go, Miguel T Pupo taking off the bottom and up and out so Kaipo breaking down the challenge as well with this overlapping swell and some of those ribs that John John was talking about in his in his last heat said how tough it was to set your rail and this is classic Toledo he just loves hanging out with the Brazilian storm win or lose he's gonna be back there on the steps backing Miguel Pupo as he wants to see Pupo into the semifinals I do believe that's been a real edge for the Brazilian Storm, just the, the, the fraternity they have amongst themselves, and they just back each other all the way. It's, a, it's amazing. They hoot each other, and uh, they, they really get behind it. And no matter who wins, I mean, they all celebrate, and, wow, they are really a force to reckon with. Was that always common, Bugs, uh, through the 70s, 80s? Well, we'll get back to that. We've got Pupo up and out. But when did it really seem like it became an official crew backing each other heat by heat? Because it... Seems like it was fairly individual back then. It was very individual. I'll tell you where I first noticed it come along. It was when this, when this young generation from, from California came on. You know, Tom Curran, Mike Parsons, Chris Farrell, Ted Robinson, McNulty's. Um, you know, it was a really solid California crew and others. And they, they really backed each other. The, I think with the Australians who had, you'd have to say they'd, they'd probably dominated before that. Very individual. <laughs> <laughs> 13 on the clock. Callum Robson looking for a semifinal against Pupo. He had to redirect, so still has to throw down his first turn. Healthy looking carve. Seamless off the bottom, trying that rail back down to the bottom. Flowing through the whitewater well. So he almost anticipated a turn early, had to change his mind, but definitely recovered well from that. The 427 is his low score. That should be gone. You see Kale looking a little bit concerned with probably the start of that wave, but he's still going to have his lead. Yeah, it was. Um, he, he really didn't go for that first section. He went around it, and uh, I think it just sort of took him out of his natural rhythm. I guess he's you know you know you think about the last heat with Philippe Toledo looking for that 6.5 sort of backup. He was looking to get around this section, so he just didn't like the look of the lip. It, it had collapsed on him a bit, but kind of a little surprise he didn't hit it. He thought, I think, I think he thought the section after that was going to be a really clean bowl, and still looks pretty good. Definitely used a lot of the open face once he got there. I certainly think he made up for that delayed start for a big first turn. The 427 should be gone. We'll find out in just a moment. We'll take a Bonsoy brew break. The quarterfinals continue right after this. This is my local beach, so any opportunity to give back and keep the beaches as clean and healthy as possible, that's what I want to do. We Are One Ocean is an initiative led by the WSL to inspire our global surf community to protect and conserve our one ocean. It's just good to show that it only takes a little bit and you can make a big difference. And if we all band together, it actually becomes one big, beautiful change. Help us protect the future of our sport. To learn more, go to weareoneocean.org.
number 72. Coming up next, Jack Robinson from West Oz takes on Italo Ferreira in quarterfinal number four. Robinson and Italo going head to head in a rising swell. And it was really important for all these Victorians to take a look at the quarterfinals and see some true representation from the Aussies with four Australians in the draw when we started the quarters. Three Brazilians, one surfer representing Hawaii. John John, he's knocked out of the contest by Toledo on the top end of the draw. We're working the out the semifinal number two. Callum so far out in front over Miguel Pupo in front of a crowd that a lot of them showed up at about six o'clock this morning. It was really cool. Ripco put on a bunch of movies on the jumbotrons. The food truck started firing up. Yeah, they come in from all over. They walk in, they drive in. It's like, you know, at six o'clock in the morning, it's like it's like Woodstock. <laughs> it, it certainly is. There's a family at the top of the car park that they've been selling tickets here, Bells, for 30 years. It's a tradition on Easter weekend. And no matter what's going on on the beach around Jack Robinson, that's just not in his mind. So focused, even well before the contest starts. He said sleep is a part of his training. Leads a very healthy lifestyle. And I ran into his wife the other day, and he's, she's like, well, we've been here ever since Portugal ended. They've just went straight to bells. Yeah. And he's focused on the next goal of ringing the big bell. Yeah, you really, uh, he really puts up that cone of silence around him as he, you know. Uh, amazing preparation, like, you know, we've seen Jack come through, as you said the other day, since he was 12 years of age, you know. He's been a, a superstar in the making. And he's handled it so well. I mean, only, you know, some prodigies know what it's like to be talked about, to be critiqued when you're just a little kid. Uh, you could see people seeking a lot of help to get through that, even with the good. You know, you, you've got to really understand your own goals. And Jack has been brilliant at that in the last few years, uh, turning into a man and controlling his destiny. You know, there was that question there for a while, though, Joe, because we just knew if, if he could get it onto the CT, we knew, you know, like Chopu, Sunset Beach, Pipeline, you know, or g -Land coming up at J-Bay, all these races, Bells Beach, Snapper. He went, oh, gosh, he's made for it. But he had to actually battle his way through those two to three foot shore breaks, you know, those beach breaks against all those whiz kids, right? And then he battled for a few years, and, and he was, you know, he was getting knocked back. But then Sunset Beach saved him. There was that one opportunity, and he took it with both fists. Well, there was this idea that the QS wasn't really helping people qualify and be prepared for the Dream Tour locations. Uh, Jack was brought up a lot. Why isn't he on tour yet? This is one of the best in the world, but it was a revamped Challenger series that makes a lot of sense where you've got Holly Eve on the calendar. You have Snapper Rocks, which opened up the CT for over two decades. You've got Hossiger, southwest of France, that has also been on the CT calendar for 20 years. Sakurema, which is also the championship tour venue now. You have these world-class venues that will really promote radical surfing in waves that are similar to what you'll find on the championship tour. Yeah, I'm, I'm a huge fan of the Challenger Series. I think that's been a wonderful um, addition. And it also, you know, gives a lot more definition in the career path as well as it's a tour into its own right. And it, and it helps to make up that and reflect the depth of professional surfing. Great surfers from every coastline in the world. With now six minutes to go on the clock, Callum enjoying this lead with time winding down. Miguel Pupo searching for his first semifinal at Bells. Uh, we were referencing that great start he had at Snapper in 2015 where he was third in the world heading into Bells, but then he got a 25th at this venue. So to see him knocking at the door of the final five is so impressive for him. Now he's 30 years of age and he's in the prime of his life. If he wins this seat, he's up in the final five position on the live rankings. That is awesome. Steady work for Pupo with priority. He's fallen a lot. He's taken nine waves. His best of 5-2-3, so barely broke the fours that he was getting previously. Yeah, he's going to have to channel 
what he did uh, against Kolohe the other day because he got these he got the bomb sets he got he picked the right waves they were built for that backhand attack there's anticipation from his brethren Felipe Toledo cheering on Miguel Pupo hits the float section almost thought he was going down big top turn regains control you can see all the bumps he's fighting through tags it well with some power jams it off the lip with a controlled slide on a big section Miguel Pupo rides away from his best score of the quarterfinal well time's a real factor here but he's got the boys revved up and uh, there was a lot of white water and you know it, it was a difficult wave to him to uh, manhandle but he did it he did a sterling job and that yeah but just like Kaipo mentioned there's a lot of turbulence on the face it was really evident there for Pupo that's probably why he's been going down on a lot of those opening sections what happened this time well he actually liked the shape of the wave he, he knew there was a lot of white water from the previous wave but look at this he gets his series of backing snaps and uh, a fourth one here in the bowl and he had to really handle that wave uh, this was classic Pupo and Joe when you slow it down he's got such a great backhand attack you really get to enjoy how smooth he is and how radical he can be once he hits the lip another lip line that kind of moved a bit on him yeah, did he, it. he was able to hang on to the rail that was very difficult full stretch it and felt like every section was trying to take him down but he manhandled this finish yeah and that was really clean got a nice little tail slide there and a big rooster tail over the back and that's a that's an exclamation mark on that ride for sure he'll certainly break it'll be his best he's uh, well and truly in the heat but there's only three minutes left and you know we've actually had a 50 minute heat <laughs> we certainly have we had the restart almost thought they were going to let the clock go but with all the time we have, Pratama feeling generous, fresh clock. Uh, I shouldn't say generous. I guess when you don't see set waves, he's, re he's really looking at the scoring potential. If they're being a little bit too aggressive defensively, he'll let them know that they're not going to get a fresh clock. We're happy they did because we're seeing some big scores, and Pupo's best is going to challenge Callum's best, a 7.6, almost matching Callum's score. Pupo needs a 5.95 now with 2.20 on the clock. Well, he's got time, but he's, he's going to need some uh, the rhythm of the ocean. He doesn't have priority. That's going to be a major factor. I can't see Callum going this wave. Not when uh, he's got his opponent out there. He's in the lead. He's, uh, he can dominate the break. Pupo's actually got to sort of get in position and then, and then again reposition according to the priority with the, the clock against him tough one for Miguel Pupa but he is the man with the most experience qualifying at a mid-season rotation in 2011 he's going to go for this one what's Callum going to do 90 seconds on the clock Pupo under priority paddles into this one no signs of Callum needs a 595 nothing on offer there so Pupo was hoping that the inside of that wave would surprise him with a better wall or he was hoping that the rookie would go well, i better take this one off him but callum has been a cool customer he got clutch rides at the end of his heats and now it's a clutch stay wave selection so incredible i feel like one surfer that defined not chasing every wave down in a heat was tom curran and uh, going back to that you know the We'll see how this ends up first, whether uh, there's a ride here. The uh, Callum might have to consider going this one. No, he's going to let it go. It's, he reckons it won't be enough, but I'll tell you what, Pupo will go this. 40 seconds, needs a 5.95. Big snap to start for Pupo. Big vert again. Great start. There's the carve and the Brazilian storm screaming. Oh, he's claimed it. He's told the judges, I think I'm on the road to mecca as he's looking to stay on his feet he belted those first sections it can be tough to get a huge score when it's not a set wave but he doesn't need an excellent number big belt there pupo celebrates oh wow 
and we'll close this one out. Callum Robson with priority. Had the ability to shut it down with some defense and Pupo got a wave underneath priority to try to turn it at the buzzer. What's happening here? What do you see in bugs? Oh, uh, no, that's an XA paddling out. So yeah, I just thought that Callum might have got a wave that we didn't see. So yeah, Jack Robinson, Itzula Ferreira coming up next. That heat's on hold. Pupo's now waiting for the decision. Wow, tricky. That is gonna be a ball line decision. He needs a six. It's not a an insignificant score. Let's break this one down, Joe. This this turn here, here's the money turn. Bang. So two scintillating turns on the outside. He claims it. It's more an appeal. It certainly is, and you're going, is this wave big enough? Are those sections big enough for the judges to turn the heat? They have easy comparisons to make because Callum's low is a 587. Miguel needs a 595, so it would have to be better than Callum's low score. And he jams it. I felt like his flow was solid. First two points, he was very aggressive in the bowl. And certainly he worked hard in that heat. 12 waves ridden for Pupo compared to three for Callum. Okay. Now they're going to look at, at Callum's 587 very closely here. They're going to look at that. Then they're going to bring it back to that last wave. It was a smaller wave. It wasn't as big as Callum's. It's going to be uh, the backhand versus the forehand attack here. The carving of Callum versus just that beautiful combination of major maneuvers. Oh gosh, look, one judge has it right on the button. This is going to be unbelievable. This one judge has it way a full point under. That's a, that's a bit, nah, it's not going to make it. As we see all the scores drift in on screen, one more to make it official. <laughs> what a teaser, that judge gave it a six and then the rest gave it fives. He needs a 5.95, they drop the high and the low. Oh. Another judge said it was enough by a lot, but it'll average out underneath. Callum Robson survives an incredibly close decision. I'll tell you what, Joe, that was a big spread. That was a five to a six five. And they dropped the high and the low, the middle three. Felt it was just under Callum Robson's performance. Callum, the rookie, is gonna be into the semifinals at the Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach, joined by the winner of the next matchup. Jack Rabo takes on Italo after this. This is an excellent score, a 917. Yeah, I wanted to show what I'm capable of so I can, can take it to another level and yeah, love bringing that. I'm feel confident, so let's go on the next one. But yeah, I'm ready for anything. Yeah, let's go.
Jack Robinson takes on Italo Ferrer here in the quarterfinals. Heat number four getting started with a rising swell. Regular foot Australian looks like he wants a piece of this thing just standing up out of the whitewater. That is tough to do with all the power of the Southern Ocean on your back. Starts with a fading cutback. Robinson trims it back into the power source. Nice steady style. Super clean on that wrap once again. Now hard off the bottom, big section. Robinson drills it shut on his opener. Nice easy pace for Jack Robinson out the back bugs. A cool carving work. Couple of nice fades and there's a lot of closeout hacks that we see on tour. That's a big section. He hit it well. Nice control and timing. We'll wait for that score to come through, but let's hear from the rookie, Callum Robson's with Shannon. Wow, what a finish. Callum, talk to me about thoughts standing here waiting for those scores to drop through. Um, yeah, well, at the end there, I, um, I knew when he got that seven, that was a good way, so I knew I just had to try and control the back half of that, like the last remaining minutes of that heat, and there's that little one that he caught, and I thought it was, it was just too wide. I thought that it wasn't going to give him as many sections as it did, but um, he, ripped, he ripped it so hard, and... Um, yeah, I, when I was walking up the beach, everyone was like, showing like bad luck and stuff. So um, when I heard the score, they didn't get it. I was like, for the bullet dodge for sure. Now talking heat strategy, it's your rookie season. Were you doubting after not taking off on that wave and letting him go? Or was it that you were paying attention to that set rolling through behind? I seen the set out the back. That's why I didn't like pull the trigger. But um, of course, as soon as I seen him start like the float and then fins out and spray, I was like, oh my gosh, I win that thing. And then I got the sets in the head, but that's life. Luckily, in my way. Amazing. You're on an absolute roll. Talk to me about making it this far into the draw here, Bells. Yeah, definitely. I just can take it one at a time. I'm just like working with Cowboy Warren here. He's um, we've been coming up with good heat strategies every heat and just trying to execute them the best I can. And I feel like I'm just getting better and better. So hopefully, tomorrow we get some waves and yeah, it should be a good show. Well, well done out there. Congratulations for the win. Thank you. Callum Robson looking really comfortable. One of the best performances this season out of the rookie class into the semifinals. We're celebrating him getting out of the biggest heat of his life against Big Fanning. And then squeaks one past Pupo. That was extremely close. But now we've got a new heat on our hands. Jack Robinson taking on Italo Ferreira. Kaipo, you saw that bomb that Jack took off on. How did it look like from your angle? Oh, yeah, I'm out the back with Domenic, and that bomb came through, and he actually was pushing up the buoys right here in the lineup. It was one of the bigger waves I've seen all day long. Jack Robinson was able to kind of foam into it, prone into it, and get on that one. He was able to be in position because he paddled out here at the channel. Italo Ferreira paddled out from behind the reef and got caught inside and you know what right now we got more bomb sets coming right now Joe oh man it is starting to turn on size wise out here we love it Kaipo and it's so interesting these guys are just taking it heat by heat just going what will we have how many sets will we have to utilize and these are absolute bombs they're still paddling for the horizon getting smoked that's the jet ski buoy that just went by the Southern Ocean is waking up. This is exactly why we went on hold today. And we didn't want to leave until we saw this new swell fill in. 5.83 for Jack Robinson on that opener. And Italo still waiting to get started. I mean, it takes a lot to slow Italo down from getting a first ride. I mean, what about a rising swell to put you out of position? That's the only thing that's holding him back. Yeah, and I, I did see more. You can see more lines coming. This is just. It's gone to a new level, and here's Italo. On his opener, 2018 Bells champ starts with a beautiful snap through the whitewater. So much spray off the tail in the bottom turn. Uses that rib to redirect into the pocket. Now swinging onto the open face. Taking a big risk on the backhand float, basically on the lip line of that closeout section, he'll go down. It just reminded me in 2019 when he was going through his Bell's title defense and he got smashed way down there on the end of a bomb. It was huge that season. He had a pretty wild wipeout. Ended up really close to the, the button of Winky Pop. Yeah, that button's uh, pretty pretty full on. I mean, it's, it's very, very intimidating when you get close to it, either 
so on, you know, paddling out on a big day or where these guys ride to right down there looking for that last massive closeout maneuver. And uh, no, it's a, it's a heavy spot to land. Now seeing more water out the back. Jack always loves heavy water waves. I think he became world famous as a slab specialist. But we've seen how consistent and dangerous he is in waves like Sunset Beach, Haleiwa. He calls the North Shore of Oahu like a second home. He's got a lot of friends that are like family there, but it's not just slabbing waves that he loves. He loves just raw power of the ocean where he can lay down some big carves. Jack holding his position now. Yeah, his relationship with the ocean is, is just marvel. It's something to marvel at. He's got this affinity. And, you know, obviously, you know, he brought up in the heavy waves of uh, WA. Now, look, the buoy nearly comes with him. But this wave, this is so powerful, this wave, that it's actually, it's gone past the bowl. And now it's standing up through that middle part down towards Winky. And this is where the, this is very unusual for him to, uh, a server to get all his points beyond the bowl. But this last turn, he, he gets a 5 8 3 basically based on this incredible closeout Rio. I mean, it was just... A big, powerful wave. And, uh, you know, it's hard to, for people to understand how powerful this break is, Joe. And I love the response from Italo. He's just a madman on waves where he can control the pace, but I love how glued he was to the power source. He's using, he's using the rib on the next car to really bank on to do his roundhouse wrap. I love the way he used that rib as well, but uh, he came unstuck there, and he, he wouldn't be happy about that. I mean, he was... He was going to have a pretty special ride. So exchange out of the way to start. 4.33 for Italo. 5.83 for Jack. As this quarterfinal can get even more exciting because we've got the phone ringing. It's time for a Boost Mobile. Stay connected. Call a two-time world champ and a former Bells champ joining us. Tommy Carroll. So great to see you. Thanks for calling in. Yeah, Joey. Hey, Bugs. Hey, Joey. Good to see you, Tom. Unreal. Uh, Tommy, uh, yeah, let's... Yeah, wow. What, a, what an event. Yeah. Wow. Let's begin with this. Uh, how would you describe Rabbit as a competitor? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Tenacious. Com just tough. Very tough competitor in anything, too. It was just across the board. Anything, anything you're paddling out against Bugs in your... You've got to have your best game on, and that's what he told me. That was so cool, Bugs. You had longevity. You still competed until, like, 88, so you saw the reign of Tommy Carroll, two-time world champ. How would you describe Tommy as a competitor? Yeah, well, uh, Tommy was a, a phenomenal competitor, and uh, we had some ding-dong battles. Tommy and I had some ding-dong battles. I mean, we really, you know... <laughs> Very, very aggressive. <laughs> very aggressive. No, but I mean, it was, it was surfing, though. You know, I mean, we had surf battles, and it was on the yeah. wave. <laughs> That's all time. Uh, Tommy, I'm going to pull your name up here. This is a very special trophy. Uh, your final out here, 90, 1986, taking the big bell. A big statement for the Goofy Footers as well. Uh, what can you tell us about mm. that final back in 86? Was it against Tommy Curran? It was against Tommy Curran, and uh, it was when Tom was about to take his title, his, his, his world title, and um, from me. And I felt at that point I'd had a bit of a rough year. I'd, I'd finally got myself back in a final towards the end, and uh, and and he'd had a blinding heat in the semi-final, where they both went to town, and I and I had a whole nother agenda i really really wanted to concentrate and 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 get a win underneath my belt i knew that that took a little bit of wind out of tom's sails but that's i don't want to i never used to take any assumptions like that with tom at all because he could he could dial a wave up in the last dying seconds of the heat so but that was very a, a great win for me but you know bells as holds a you know big part a big place in my heart being one of those first places I went to as a kid to compete uh, back in 1976 and then <clears throat> and then actually getting my first tour final was um, against Mark Richards at Winky Pop it was pretty hectic in <laughs> in, uh, in 1982 watching the you know he was going on a, on 
on a rampage and he was going for his fourth world title. But it was um, it was amazing just paddling out for that final and, uh, you know, coming in sort of, OK, I guess, <laughs> I guess I've got some work to do. <laughs> and yeah. Tommy, uh, I don't know if you remember, but, uh, you know, we're watching the quarterfinals here. In that 1982, you and I had a quarterfinal at Bells, and uh, we usually yes. used to we usually used to meet in the semi-finals or the finals. But that time, we met in the quarters, and you got me yeah. out of Bells on your way to that final with Mark Richards. And I had a big on my bonnet about getting something on the backside out there. I really did. Yeah. Bells, yeah, it was a beautiful backside wave, and you see well. Miguel, you know, and all you see in Italo, you're just being able to use. And like you mentioned just a moment ago, that amount of power in that wave just offers that heel turn off the bottom so much. You know, it's, uh, I, yeah, I miss it. I'm just watching it today, just going, oh, I just want to get one of those heel turns in. Death, aim it up off the lip. Oh, yeah. So great, Tommy Carroll. It's, yeah, it's so, good, such a good, good opportunity stuff, to uh, yeah, catch man. up with you and, and really talk about the season. This is stop number four uh, from all-time conditions. We had a pipeline your, yourself winning at pipe in your career, one of the all-time greats. To, to kind of catch up to where we are today with, you know, having Baron Mamiya win as a wild card, having some young names like Callum Robson, a rookie who's in the semifinals. How have you been enjoying the tour so far this year? Oh, look, uh, you know, just watching Pete, watching these young guys come through with so much strength and power and command over what they're doing. You know, um, Ethan Ewing in the first quarter final, you know, and, and then Cullum just coming through with an amazing command over himself in the dying stages of that heat. Thank you. And, and just practicing um, that, just showing such incredible strength and form throughout. Uh, and, and, you know, just all of the young guys, you know, Imaya Kalani, um, you know, showing amazing form too. Just all these guys coming through. It's 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 super exciting for me. I it just keeps me fully engaged in what I love doing and, and love watching. It uh, so I really, really, really um, yeah, I get I just get excited when it's coming up. And I know that when <laughs> West Oz comes up, here we go again. I can't <laughs> I'm just really looking forward to seeing what comes up there. Hey Tom, I just want to uh, ask you about this there's a conversation we had that I, I quoted many, many times. It was a, one day we were at a cloud break and it was, a, it was about 10 feet. And you, in, in between a, a little break in the action, you went out there and just, you know, carved it up and had a fantastic surf. The action started again. And we were sitting on the boat, dangling our feet over. And I said to you, I said, Tom, wow, we got the dream tour going. I said, this thing would have been made for you. You would, you would have just loved this dream tour. And you, turn, <laughs> and you turned around to me and you said, Bugs, I wish I didn't listen to him, and that was because it, it, <laughs> about retiring. Yeah. Yes, that's it. <laughs> I, I must admit, if I just took a break for a little bit, <laughs> which I found it very hard to take a break on anything, Bugs. Back yeah. then, there's no way I could take a breather. <laughs> it was just full 150% all the time, and actually, you know. The first person I watched take a break was Kelly Slater, like a proper break, and and uh, then Tom Curran did too. But I just couldn't take a break. And but thankful. Oh, here we go. Here, here we go. go. We've got some Good goofy foot action. Great to have. I know. Should say uh, Italo. Italo. Sorry. That's right. Italo. Oh. Lively backhand flow. Wow. Big transition off the bottom. Nice snap there. Italo ditches the two with this wave, mm. and he belts it again. Definitely his best high performance approach that he's had so far in the matchup with Jack Robinson crushes it looks like he wants a board change he wrote a replica of the board he won bells on in 2018 this morning he said he was in two minds throughout the day which one he wanted to ride so it's either maybe something uh, he wants a different feel or he might have creased it on that last wave. Yeah, well, it's it's a timely move for him with 18 minutes left. He's still got plenty of time on the clock to get it. He'll be able to do the uh, the pit stop and uh, quickly get out there and get the jet ski back. That's the beauty of the jet ski assist. In the old days, this would have taken, this would have been about an eight minute pit stop. <laughs> That's it. It certainly That's would have been. Sure. And Italo is just uh, such a high energy athlete and good thing for him he got a, a, some solid hooks on that wave it wasn't like he had to come in on a wave that wasn't going to be utilized in his top two now with 1730 to go Italo moving a bit closer up in the top end of the rankings 
looking for a second world title this year. Tommy Carroll, you're a two-time world champ. Uh, did it feel like the second title was harder or, or, or easier than the first one? Well, for me, um, you know, each, each one was just as hard. I mean, the first one, I just didn't even believe it really until it just happened because I had, I was so concentrated on the moment and getting through that, you know, getting through each event to win that world title. It was against Bugs, really. I mean, yeah. we fought it out really hard for that. Uh, that first world title was a, a big one, but then it's almost a reinvention. Every time we go back out to compete, it's a reinvention of who we are, invention. And so going out to the next, two, you know, you go straight into the two and all of a sudden you may not even get through the first heat. So you've got to, you know, reinvent the whole wheel within yourself, really, which is, is a big, big thing to do. The next year you had to really confront a whole bunch of amazing competitors coming in, uh, like uh, Michael Okalupo started to really take form. And that was very, very tough to deal with um, because he, you know, his form at that age was extraordinary. It was groundbreaking, and uh, and so it was, he he challenged me at a deep level at that point in that second year. Uh, actually, it pulled, helped me pull myself out of myself, <laughs> if you like, <laughs> if you like, and allow myself to recreate. Yeah, which was, um, yeah, it, it turned out, um, you know, a, you know, a confirmation of. You kind of after coming, watching MR win four, four in a row, to win one and then not win the next one, that <laughs> sort of like felt to me like, oh god, like that could be a fluke, you know. Uh, so, and that's how it felt for me coming, yeah, coming in for the second world title was super important. Um, uh, then, um, yeah, following into the third one, actually a uh, third year in a row. I won the first three events in the first two events in that next year, and then I did an ankle, which kind of didn't get better for like six months. So that that sort of changed my sh the shape of my uh, momentum. Mm. Oh, that would make sense. Yeah, the injury mm. slowing down the momentum mm. to defend mm. that second world title. As we see Italo, mm. he got the 6.4 on that last replay, made the board change. And now here comes wow. Jack Robinson with a lot of foam on the face. Carves the first section. Needs a 4.91 to take the lead. Mm. Clean off the top there for Jack. Deep off the bottom, there's another open face hook. Stretching this wall out, punches out the lip line. Maybe one more if he can get there. A big flow. Robinson has been really effective on those closeout re entries today. Yeah, he's been a little bit out of sorts, I think, on the bowl, but he's, he's been finishing with a flourish. I mean, really powerful finishes, and that's sort of steady well in, uh, in this heat. But this wave here, he paddles onto it. He's been quiet. He hasn't had a wave for about 14 minutes. And there's, look at how much white water's on this face, Jay. It's just chattering. You can see his board moving up and down, finally able to set his rail on the sharp eye. And once he does, he connects well off the lip and really set up himself well for that end section. Judges love huge sections like that, Bugs, on the end, and he, he greased it perfectly. Yeah, he really did. He finished that one with a one-two combo, and yeah, that stoked him out. Tommy Carroll, I always love when I show up online on Instagram and you're guiding people through meditations. It's, it's, I, I, I get yes. really uh, worried if I'm going to miss it at times because it's such a healthy way for, for me to slow down. And I think of you and I think of Jack Robinson often yeah. because we'll see Jack before mm. a heat really quiet the noise around him. And, and I know, you know, a lot of people mm. are into their mental prep, but I mm. think Jack more so than others is really making it of, of a big importance to how he competes. Do you watch Jack do that? And do you kind of know what he's going through in his state of meditation as he prepares for the tour? I haven't talked to him, you know, about that particular prep, but I've talked to him about meditation on a, a number of times and, and actually just sort of preparation for the tour. And it's lovely when, when Jack comes from uh, an incredible space just like Rabbit talked about earlier he talked about how amazing a feel he had an affinity for for water whether you know how however, however heavy so what Jack is doing he, he already knows underneath how uh, how he needs to connect 
with the ocean and how we need to connect as, as surfers before we, meet, we reach the, the, you know, get in the flow of things, really. We're not upset any kind of flow. So it's, um, that, that's the outcome from practicing meditation. And I know that what Jack moves in those areas and practices regularly. So uh, I think for any, if you're anyone working in any sort of, uh, you know, arena where we need to reach and actually pinpoint ourselves in peak performance, uh, it's just an amazing tool. It's like, you should, just like you've got a, a good saw in your toolbox or a good, you know, a hammer or whatever you want, you've got your toolbox going, the meditation is a very powerful one and can, can really, you know, reorder the mind. And that's what he's doing, just getting that mind in order before he goes in there and applies himself. You get to supply yourself at so many levels as a surfer. You've got this moving wave, moving board, moving you, moving wind. The whole thing's moving. So let's get into getting into flow with that. I don't know that that's been, you know, um, that, that's been my experience. I mean, <laughs> I don't know when I'm out of sorts, it doesn't sort of, sort of fit and I'm out of flow. It's, it's all over the place. And, uh, yeah, it's a beautiful practice to get into regularly. But uh, Jack is certainly one of those guys that I remember seeing him as a kid coming to the surf, I never met, met him before, and he, here we go, looks like they've got a bit of a, a little creeping set, this beautiful swell arriving into Bells. But I noticed, when I first saw him surf, he paddled, it was, it, it was at the Quicksilver Pro, up there at Snapper Rocks, it was big, quite solid Snapper Rocks, and Jack, Jack, this little kid with a bowl head, bowl head, just, <laughs> here we go, Italo, Italo, he had a, he had a bowler cut, you know, like, um, he just paddles out, this kid's like, you know, about 12, goes straight outside, back of Snapper Rocks, and just takes off in the middle of everything on the biggest set. And then I just, <laughs> he just weaved his way through it all. Uh, it was a very, very natural uh, move. Here we go, to lay on the inside. This inside section is so difficult to hit. And these guys are doing an incredible job there, Italo. Mm. Well done for Italo. Loving those stories uh, from mm. meeting Jack Robinson for the first time. And Italo is able to get some solid work done, a big finish as well. Jack did get the lead on his, the seven that he locked in on wave number two. So Italo on that effort needed a, a 6.44 to get the lead. Bugs, how are you feeling about that one? Yeah, pretty solid for Italo on this one. He, th these guys are leapfrogging each other. We've got a great quarterfinal on our hands here. Italo, uh, he had to really manhandle that wave and it was a difficult beginning again. You know, he had to, this is the trick about Bells. It'll, it'll upend the best of them in the business, you know. He had, look at this thing, he's on his, on the prone position, but how quick is he, he's, he's uh, <laughs> you know, the, 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 the quick fire nerve twitches of Italo are amazing, eh, Tom? Oh, absolutely, that's why I love Italo. Look at how deep he goes into the bottom turns. And everything is on edge and actually at the max potential. That's what I love about Italo. Yeah, no, he pulls back here and there, but really he just goes. Look at that. And that's such a hard, you know, that bugs that, that end section. Oh. You can't really go right to the base of the wave to hit it. You gotta kind of come from the middle of the face of the wave because it's sort of, it, it kind of fills up, but it slabs over. And if you try to come right off the bottom, he, he actually nailed it right. You've got that, he did have a tricky time at the beginning in that in that last wave was the second to last wave where he said he kind of tried to time it but he kind of got out of rhythm but that one he nailed it and that first big hack that he did on outside on the outside he just laid that i don't know how his fins are he's <laughs> still in the board oh it's all time i mean tom if you had to pick one surfer on tour that you relate the most to that maybe reminds you of yourself a bit when you were competing is there a surfer on tour that stands out well, Italo. That's uh, right. It's me, you know. Italo, Italo and I kind of got some affinity there. Oh, and, yeah. Uh, it's kind of cool. Last last year, we we got together and had a few surfs before the event at Narrabeen. And uh, and I hadn't really surfed with him just solo. I just hung out with him a bit. And, yeah, we, we, we just clicked. <laughs> Uh, it makes perfect sense. Uh, Tommy Carroll, a two-time world champ, a Bells champ. But you're a legendary human as well. Uh, we enjoy your time Thank so you. much. Uh, we can't get enough of you, man. Thanks so much for calling in. I really appreciate you guys having me. And good to see you, Bugs. And yeah, Joey. Tom. Have a, have a great event. I'll keep listening. 
I'm awesome. real, man. Can't wait to see you soon. Tommy Woo. Carroll, everybody. Uh, what an epic human being. We'll be catching up for the rest of this heat in just a moment. Italo still leads over Jack Robinson. Back for more right after this. Just getting onto the World Tour was a crazy thought to me. Well, I've said this so many times. If you had told me at the start of the year that I was going to get in the top five, I would have said you bullshit. Yeah, you want to win the titles and stuff, but you know, I really look forward to the performances, having some good battles of guys and bouncing off each other, then you're putting on a show for everybody. And then that leads to the, the event wins or the titles, whatever it be, then that comes after that. Always fun to flash back, especially if it features a monumental win for a surfer on tour. 2018 Rip Curl Pro Bells Beach. Italo had the biggest day of his life at the time. Beat Mick Fanning in the final. Remember, this was an emotional event for Fanning, retiring from full-time competition. Italo, this was just a big step in creating himself as a true world champion. Yeah, this was an amazing win, and uh, what a maiden tour victory. A Bell's trophy against a, you know, three-time world champion. Everything, it's a fairy tale. Just heard this racket up the stairs when he got up to the top. He was punching out the showers, screaming that I did it. As we see a stumble in the whitewater here, 5.15 on the clock. Italo just went down there. Jack Robinson with priority has been incredibly selective. He uses priority here. Deep bottom turn and ends up going into a layback. Not the way he wanted to start that wave. His first mistake in the matchup. Yeah, well, uh, Italo had another super late takeoff and uh, kind of looked like he went over the handlebars a bit on that one. And then Jack just, uh, not sure what happened there. You see so much movement in the water bugs on a swell that's rising like this. It seems pretty tough to just sink that rail. By the time you get to the lift, the w open face is so big, it seems like he tried to switch gears at the last second. Yeah, that's right. He didn't have enough time to get his arc into place. And, you know, it, Bells, it, it's it's a matter of controlling your speed and the speed of the wave that there's... And, uh, yeah, he was probably just traveling too fast and he just didn't get his body in position. So now Italo will get priority. This will be a tough situation for Jack. Yeah, and I see, I see a... Uh, there's a, a medium set here. Uh, I'm seeing some pretty big lines further out, Joe. I think we're going to see some more action. Here comes a pretty solid set. Jack Robinson has been brilliant in this contest. Huge alley-oops. Eliminated Leo Ferravanti pretty aggressively with a high-performance approach in the first few minutes. Then had a high-scoring heat against Imai Kalani Devault where the rookie from Maui really was impressive to start, but Jack dug deeper. He's been in fine form. This quarterfinals very effective for Robinson as his coach, Matty Bemrose, looks on. He was yeah. tied for 18th coming in, knew the cutoff was approaching quickly. It reminded me of moments uh, when we saw him in Mexico because we, we talk about the celebratory moment of that win, but he needed it to, to stay on tour. I'm kind of feeling he's channeling the same type of vibe as that Mexico performance. Well, now that set bugs that you saw is right on top of him now. Yeah, there's a big one here, and that's for sure. And every time Italo's been just slightly caught out, he's had to do a super late takeoff. There's a lot of white water in the face. And again, just caps over. Nobody gets it. I guess advantage. Italo maintains priority. There are more waves coming here. Now, these second waves are a lot smoother. A lot of white water. Italo says, "No, I'm not going to. I'm not going to give him a priority up on this one." He, he paddled with a little bit of intent. They won't take it off him. 
He pulled back just in time for sure. And uh, I think there's some more action coming to look how close these guys are. Jack's just sort of sidled onto the inside section here, but it's the priority of the world champion that will be the difference here. And they are within each other's wheelhouse. Look at that. They are hitting each other with every paddle. You can see those connections with that paddle battle. It's a big oh. lineup, a big ocean. That is good. Get us getting your opponent in check right there. He is within his turning circle of his surfboard. And now Jack comes back. A little bit of separation now, but Italo, his head down. He doesn't want his opponent to get a wave with a minute 40 left. It looks like Italo's in the prime position to get it. And now with priority, Italo will take this wave off Robinson. Jack's probably happy to get some space. Stretched out float to start. Setting up that backhand wrap. The 2019 world champ goes straight up in the pocket. Right into a bottom turn. Lays down the wrap again. All set up work to set up the final move. Stays on his feet. Solid performance for Ferreira into the final minute. Jack's got priority. Crazy to see how aggressive that moment was. Italo, you know, had the ability to shadow him, but he wanted to really get into that space. Whoa. Reminded me a bit of that moment with Zeke and John John back in the day, where Zeke was just circling John. And, you know, reminding me of uh, Medina and Italo as well. <laughs> and that would have been Medina pulling that number on him. And he's still going out the back. He's still going with 36 seconds remaining. Maybe he's going to just fight this one to the death. And I think Jack's going to have another shot here, Joe. 26 seconds remaining. He's still got time to even have a think about this one for sure. Jack Robinson. Last wave of the heat. Robinson going for broke here. Beautiful carve, using a lot of space. Goes up vertical with the drift, and he nails it. Setting up the wrapping turn. He's got to be perfect through the inside. Throws down the wrap. There's the horn. Winding up for a finish. Jack Robinson rides away clean. What a fantastic finish to quarterfinal number four. Things got aggressive out the back. Italo still waiting for his number to see if he improved on a 6.4. And then Jack with the answer, with the horn sounding right before his finishing move. Oh, wow, what a finish. This is all time. Both surfers making huge appeals at the end of their heats in their own fashion you know and they're more than appeals joe i feel it bells at, at this event we have seen more emotion coming out of the of the competitors male and female at the end of their rides than we've seen anywhere else i agree 100 percent bugs here's the harvey norman recap ito lovers jack obviously ito a former bells champ robinson really in his debut his rookie year didn't feature bells last season and so he's getting his feet wet on the bowl these guys uh, started out the back with a bombing set jack got the 583 but itzelo really took control with a 64 into a 7.10 but how great has jack been taking less waves this was a seven point ride yeah and uh, jack one thing about this is that it is uh, this board looks really small and he's just handling it so well, especially the last sections. So this was just the last exchange. Yeah, this, this is the, the last, last wave. Waves. This... Isolo rode one, then Jack rode this one. These haven't been scored yet. No, this is it. This is the exchange right here. And they were both brilliant rides. The Jack's on the beach now. All the work's done. He put himself in a position to fight. Look at the numbers already. It was so close before that last set came through. The fella who got it. He's got his supporters. He's, there's people saying, you got it, man. They're not judging, though. <laughs> That's right. And also Jack uh, walking up the beach with confidence. He, feel, he feels like he did enough. Yeah, this is where, you know, you can 
do all the preparation in the world, but right now there there is a lot of noise in there because you really want this. You're willing those judges to give you the points. Now it depends. He needs a 651, but that's not taking into account Italo Ferreira's wave. Did Italo improve on the uh, 64? Quite quite likely. So this is going to be a big big either a big turnaround or man, he's just. Italo's going to survive. Well, for the judges, they've got a lot of time to sort this one out. Uh, well, there's not a heat waiting uh, out the back. This is it uh, for Saturday evening. So they will take their time, make their comparisons. It's going to be incredibly close, like the entire heat was. Italo 7.10 on his best. Jack 7.0. Italo had a 6.4. And Jack had a 5.83. Then they both threw down scores where they probably both going to improve. But who will have the lead when it matters the most to get a spot in the semifinals here at Bells? Yeah, now a quiet moment of meditation and, and trying to will this score. And this is a, a really a, a long time. And we've got all night. <laughs> we certainly do. For judges to take this long, that means it's incredibly close. They'll make their comparisons. And obviously, goofy versus regular. Italo had a lot of flair on his last jack, was ultra smooth, made really decisive decisions on his final wave. I don't know if it gets any closer than this. No, this is absolutely amazing. Wow, what a, what a pause. We've already got Ethan Ewing and Felipe Toledo in semifinal number one. You, th you think this doesn't mean a lot to this guy? Uh, it means everything. He's prepared his whole life for moments like this. Italo is already in the Red Bull Athlete Zone. And just trying to find some space on the steps. Italo's rinsing things off, but he's definitely got an ear open listening to the beach announcers for the final result. Numbers coming Looks like Italo is going to improve. He's going to be. Numbers will start coming in. Last of Italo Ferreira comes in at a 6.7. Last of Jack Robinson comes at a 7.0. Pocket sevens for Jack Robinson. And we will see the Australian move on to the semifinals. Perez Dennis, straight up for Jack Robo, Italo Ferreira, center one, and a 6-7. Oh, oh, so the support crew of Italo wanted some privacy there in the Red Bull Athlete Zone, a very close loss. Italo, a former Bells champ, now out of the contest, and Jack Robinson has one of the biggest heat wins of his young career here at the Bells Bowl. Moving on to the semifinals to take on Callum Robson on finals day. Unbelievably clutch performance. Jack, a seven early. But then to do it under pressure on the final wave to get another seven and staying calm in the celebration. So much to talk about on the WSL Post Show. Coming up next here at the Rip Girl Pro Bells Beach.
having this vision. Uh, I've been having this vision. Either rise or you fall. I'm on a mission, bringing my dreams to fruition. I ain't playing at all. Bring out the body bags. I'm about to kill them, deliver them to the mortician. I gotta do what I got. Welcome to the WSL Post Show. Only four heats, but more action in those four heats than maybe we've seen all year. So much to talk about as we take a look inside the judges' booth. And you can see Italo in there breaking things down, not happy with how things panned out at the end of that heat. And he would have finished his ride off confidently, turned around and watched Jack's wave in completion. So he would have had a fair understanding of where he thought those numbers were going to go an extremely close decision let's hear from the winner though moving through to the semi-finals here at the rip curl pro bells beach jack robinson with laura annabar wow jack fireworks at the end of that heat i don't think it's come any closer or taken any longer for the judges to decide waiting on the stairs there how are you feeling yeah i knew it was it's one of those moments that um you know that you think about or you see like that just, I feel like it's happening at the start of the year, but these moments are like the finals, you know, that finish at the end of the year, you know, you're in clutch moments like that. So it's, it's nice that I got through that one now. And um, yeah, I'm just, just in my time on my zone, you know, I'm just, that was it, left it all on that one. And um, I had no real like things stopping me from doing what I was doing on that way. I feel like I had, I was free to do it, do it and um, yeah, just, just did my job and yeah. That was, I don't know what it was, it was crazy. <laughs> <laughs> and talk about the end of that heat, you had priority, you went away and it didn't turn out. Was there a moment there where you didn't think it might happen, but uh, you know, those, those sets just kept coming through. You called them right. <laughs> no, I didn't think about, about that really. I mean, sometimes it pops in your head a bit here and there, but it wasn't really, wasn't really there. It was to the, it was to the damn end, to be honest. Like I just didn't, yeah, it's always till the end, isn't it? You know, so I breathe it and that's, I believe it is, that's it. And there it is. Talk about coming up against Italo, such a fierce competitor, a, a winner, past winner. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a good, really good competitor. He's a champ, and um, but everyone is good on this tour. You know, this is best. And um, in the end, I can't really look at him any differently. It's just another guy. <laughs> and I, I stay, I stay humble. I'm good, but um, yeah, every every guy is really good. So. It's just one at a time. And you've been down here the longest of all the competitors coming straight from he Portugal here. Talk about what this means to you after all that time you put in. Yeah, it's crazy. I came straight from Portugal. I haven't been home in 10 months. Um, but it's, I'm back in Australia. I feel like home, you know, everyone. It is my home, you know. Australia is it's where I have so much support and um, I'm just happy to be in the home, homeland, home country. Well, you've got so much support and backing behind you. We'll see you in the semi-finals tomorrow. Jack Robinson, amazing work. Yeah, clutch performance there from Jack. He'll take on Callum Robson in that second semi-final, which is going to be huge for uh, for both of those surfers who are really looking to shore up their place above the, the, the cut line going into the, the mid-year cut, that last event, they've really relieved the pressure on themselves. They're going to be making a, a big jump up the ratings, uh, an amazing performance. But that heat was so close, Bugs, and, and Italo obviously feeling like it went his way. Well, there was only two tenths of a point in it. You know, I mean, there's, a, there's two big scores going on. And when it comes down to the last exchange, I mean, you know, you're going to be really ro rooting for yourself. You know, you're going to be thinking you did the job. And he's been a world champion, a Bells champion. He thought he'd got the job done. Shannon, in, in reflecting on those last couple of rides, what were your thoughts when the, the scores were, were coming through from the panel? Yeah, I mean, I think Bugs hit on it there with it just being so close that it was a question mark. So it kind of, the judges clearly took their time with it. They obviously know what they're doing up there. And, and it was very well surfed to back waves on the finish. I'm really glad they both got the opportunity and Jack got the upper hand. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's dive into the recap and get a closer look at these rides. It was a, a close heat. It didn't kick off like the, the first quarter final or the second. These surfers were kind of scrapping their way to numbers bugs and really having to work hard for their numbers. Oh, they leapfrogged each other the whole heat, Ronnie. I mean, this was a, a, a really, this was a, a street fight, this heat. 
It sure was. Jack has really just been surfing so beautifully. Uh, when you look at the numbers, Shannon, uh, it was all looking pretty positive for him. He had an excellent ride in, in the fourth round and, you know, he managed to get himself a, a seven-point ride early on to, to kind of put some pressure on this guy. But, you know, he doesn't really feel it, does he? He always reads the wave so well. Yeah, Italo is unbelievable out here. I mean, he, he Jack definitely got the job done by getting that seven early on to put the pressure onto Italo. But, I mean, he performed incredibly well in those last couple of exchanges. So it really could have gone tooth and nail either way. Um, I thought his backhand attack was really impressive from Italo. He had some really good wave selection with size, grit, kind of that wild bells that we want to be seeing when we're talking, you know, quarterfinals and beyond. And Italo did really well, but Jack, he's just been on fire. He's really been finding that rhythm, and it's exciting to see him into the semifinals at a wave that I think we're going to see so much success from him in the future, and now to be seeing it from him at a young age. And just, I mean, those down carves from him, so many of those critical maneuvers. Jack's bringing all that spice. Yeah, Bugs, we're seeing those uh, last couple of rides now, and I guess, you know, the, the first waves didn't really play too much of a part. Obviously, every score is important, but everything really hedged on that exchange. And you know, there was a, the feeling that Italo maybe did a bit more work. Like, where, where did Jack find the edge with his rod? Well, I mean, you know, I mean, seriously, if they called it a tie, I, I would have gone with that. You know, it was just so close and uh, it was a line ball decision. I mean, you know, in the end of the day, it was just, um, it came down to, I think, Jack's finishing turns. It, you know, they weren't short break turns. They were just they were on the steep face down the line a bit, and he finished just so strongly on his rides. Yeah, unbelievable. I, I mean, there, there was a, a lot of emotion from Interlo after that one. He, he hit the the Red Bull athlete zone there and just quickly ripped his jersey off and raced straight up to the panel. Well, it's understandable for Italo, like he's he's come off of such a strong performance in the last couple of years and he's sitting kind of low down the rankings for the start of the season for him. He really wants to be in a world title conversation for him and that means going past the quarters. For Jack, it's his second year on tour. Anything he gets is going to be a great result. And the, you know, the other thing about it is that quarterfinals here at Bills, you know, the whole thing about it, if you were saying at the start of the thing, I'll give you an equal fifth, will you take it? You might go, OK, but you get to the quarterfinals, you're in touching distance of the final. There's a lot of emotion riding out there in all four of those quarters. Yeah, there was uh, really interesting battles unfolding in all four. Uh, all the big performances are on the open face. The huge numbers actually were coming from the first two heats. The top half has been where the true form has been throughout the contest so far. Um, it, it was just amazing again to see Ethan Ewing, uh, Owen Wright. They, they went at it. Um, I thought Owen would have a, a better chance against Ethan if the swell kind of held in and the, the offshore was still blowing, but today he just struggled with the bump. And Ethan's so aggressive on his opening ride bugs. Yeah, Ethan just looks so solid from the get-go here. And I mean, this was just a, 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 a wire to wire victory. Yeah, yeah, really dominant. I mean, he caught three waves in this quarterfinal clash, uh, or four, but they were all solid. Uh, you know, he could have beaten Owen with his backup numbers. Well, Owen just kept going for the first wave of the of the of the uh, set as well, and there was bump on every one of his rides. He he just didn't reach the heights of his earlier rounds. And that's what we saw in some of the women's performances yesterday was just that wave selection being so critical, not jumping the gun and going on the early set. It's got to be that second or that third one to have that clean face. And Ethan Ewing has done an incredibly good job at wave selection within this event. Um, as you mentioned, Ronnie, all of his scores were above the seven point range in this heat specifically, which is incredible consistency. And I, uh, yeah, I was proud of him for taking out Owen Wright. Yeah, it was, a, it was a, a big ask too. Ethan hasn't been in this position to get himself into semifinals too often. And this is just his second semifinal uh, appearance, but it was great to have Mick Fanning in the booth with us to break down Ethan's approach and just talk about his power, the, the way he's able to actually drive that board through all the lumps and bumps that, that do pop up on days like today and still give you the impression that you're looking at a glassy lineup, Bugs, and it just wasn't the case for Owen. I mean, his wave choice was impeccable, and, and he was on, on, you know, much smoother face waves, but, you know, Mick had it right. I was listening to that. I mean, he just powers through sections. There's nothing out of place, but the, it's the subtleties of where he gets his speed and power from. 
a massive tip of the cap though to Owen Wright who came into this event way down the back end of the ratings and he's going to be making a, a big climb with that quarterfinal appearance and giving himself a much better shot at getting above the uh, the mid-year cut line over there at Margaret River. Uh, quarterfinal number two. Let's uh, <laughs> let's get into it. I mean, on paper, you, you couldn't help but start getting uh, excited about this one. The crowd on the beach certainly did and up here in the car park at Bells Beach, they were making so much noise as these two hit the lineup. It was that opening exchange that really set the tone. I was actually standing just up the steps from Ross Williams, John John's coach, as Italo took off on this wave, which was just unbelievable. It obviously came through in that high nine range. And then John went on the one behind, which was a little bit bigger. It had a little more size to it, but Philippe was able to get more work done. John's score came in just below uh, Philippe's. And I was sitting there with Ross, and Ross, before the scores were dropped, he thought it was going to go in John's favor because of wave size versus Philippe getting more work done. It was a really interesting one. Yeah, that, that is interesting. I mean, it's at that point, it's, you know, it was all excellent surfing, folks, no matter what way you look at it. But John's way flattened out a little bit. Philippe was really lucky. He's just hit that that perfect section of the reef. And even looking at John's last turn, such a difficult move to execute but uh, he didn't exactly tee off on it either. Yeah, well, I, I watched this exchange from in, in the competitors area and obviously the Brazilian uh, storm were over there and they were just so throaty on this. This was just pure. Uh, they were exalted but with the way <laughs> Philippe surfed that wave. And then others there, I mean, Chris Moore came over and said, you know, it was that wave choice and it, the bigger waves aren't always the best. Well, Felipe, he, he was here to entertain today he took off on a, a few waves after getting the big nine and he attacked the first section and then suddenly uh reeled it in richie lover picked up on it he went hang on he's already got a one point jump and some on the opening exchange if he can put a, a six on the board you know he needs a seven if he can get higher than that it's an eight so it's it was really well executed from Felipe. It felt like he kind of gathered himself halfway through that heat to finish it off. Yeah, he really just figured out how to get that backup score quickly. It was on that paddle back out that he swung and went on the next wave in the set, which wasn't even from that outside section, but it was just enough to get the job done, as you said, because he set that pace so much higher, getting into those nines on the start rather than John's eight. Yeah, and it sets up an unbelievable semi-final clash on the top side of the draw. Ethan Ewing, who's looked razor sharp and been dropping excellent scores in his last three uh, performances. And Felipe's the same. He's been dropping excellent scores. On the bottom side, uh, we've got Callum Robson. He's had one excellent score, but some solid heat score totals. He came up against Miguel Pupo, and this one also went right down to the wire with both competitors standing on the beach wondering what the outcome was <laughs> going to be when it all unfolded. Let's dive into the recap. And Bugs, you know, the, the performances on that top side of the draw, um, you know, our jaws were on the ground. These guys, you know, they, they were solid, but they're going to have to lift. Uh, and Callan Robson, he, he just did what he's been doing throughout and, and just performed with a lot of power. He's been so consistent with his performances in every heat, and he's just he's, uh, he's doing man turns. You know, his power game has really served him well. He's, uh, he's been super cool under pressure, though. That's been the, the telling point with Callum. When he's he's had clutch waves in all the, his past three heats, clutch rides when he's needed to. Just a different uh, post-heat interview with Callum these days. Uh, stop one, the Billabong Pod Pro. Uh, you were talking to him after he was getting heat wins, and he was just buzzing, just so excited. You can tell he's ended that happy zone. But Miguel Pupo, one of the, the best backhand performances in the contest this year and fought so hard to give himself a chance in the final stages. And he did so well. He made it into the quarters here at Bells. He's had really early knockouts across a decade of competing. So for him to make it this far was really important. And then he had this critical moment on the finish where Callum let him go on this way. I thought Callum was going to really uh, regret that manoeuvre. So did uh, I. Bad, bad not to take that ride with only a short amount of time on the clock. He thought there were set waves on the outside, but they actually caught him out of position. Yeah, they did. I mean, and, the, and you know, in the end of the day, if you look at the judges, this was a 3-2 decision. Two judges had him in front. One, one by, you know, a 6-5 and... I mean, and the three judges had him um, a, a little low-balled. Yeah, uh, 5.4 versus Callum's 5.87. You know, the, the only thing I can think is, is that wave just didn't have the, the height that maybe Callum's yeah. 5.87 had. But, uh, 
You know, Miguel Pupo, well, I think if he reviews it, he still might have a tough time working out how he didn't get through that heat. Uh, Callum, he was certainly relieved when they read out the score because he thought that he'd thrown his chance at a semi-final at Bells Beach away. I mean, it was honestly like, what was he thinking when he let Miguel go on that wave? Aside from the fact that he could see that set and then he just got drilled by it. It was like the biggest, widest set that had come through for the afternoon. He absolutely took it on the head. So maybe if he'd been able to tell that it wasn't really going to work out in the first place, he would have not let Miguel go. But he also thought, well, there's a better set behind. Like, he's going to have the opportunity either way. Yeah, in that situation, Bugs, I just don't think you can give someone like Miguel <laughs> a chance. And uh, anyway, he's through. He survived. And he'll now take on Jack Robinson in what will be a, a fantastic semi-final clash. Let's have a look at the leaderboard because obviously there's only four surfers left in the mix. I've, I've had a look at this live leaderboard. There's going to be such a big shuffle on the rankings coming into stop number five. But there is a, a big chance here for Felipe Toledo to uh, really confirm his spot as the most informed surfer on the rankings at the moment in fourth place and everyone around him and the top five just just fell out of the mix bugs that's right and there's a there's a really good chance for a couple of these other guys to go into the top 10 a huge chance uh, and at the back end of the leaderboard it's going to be very interesting as well here is the se semi-final bracket uh that that top semi uh it, i think they're the form surfers uh that that's Whoever gets through, that's the, the guy to beat yeah. uh, on the bottom side of the draw. You know, I mentioned all the, the big scores that were coming from Ethan Ewing and Felipe Toledo. Um, Callum and Jack just have one excellent ride each in the event so far. And I think it's going to take excellent rides to win this one. And, uh, I mean, you, you just think on, on form and on paper, you know, you'd, you'd think that going into the final day, Felipe Toledo has become the favourite. Oh, unbelievable. Yeah, he is so strong. I mean, whoever beat John John Florence was going to be the favourite to win this event because uh, in the third round, in the fourth round, Shannon, he was unstoppable. Oh, it was how could Don have been beat until that heat? And he kind of threw it at the end too where he went up for that air. He said he kind of just had the section he had to react to it. it. He had an opportunity though. Maybe if he'd stayed on rail, he could have still been ahead of Philippe in that one. But Philippe, definitely the man to beat now. Yeah, definitely. And that brings us to the Boost Mobile wave of the day. It could only be one. It was the uh, the first wave of quarterfinal number two, Bugs. Take us through it. It was something special. Well, and, and the beautiful thing about this wave, the, it, it kept giving. You know, it, it was steep all the way. It, it was like it was an elongated bowl section. Just kept bowling up for him. And it gets stronger and stronger. That was an unbelievable turn there. And then he gets one more in. Just a searing snap. And uh, this was a phenomenal ride. It, it had to go in the high nines. Yeah, I, I thought that uh, both Felipe and, and John, you know, uh, if those scores were both a, a little higher, it wouldn't have been a, a bummer. But on the first exchange of what was a, a big quarterfinal clash, you had to sort of expect that they were maybe going to bank a, a big second score, but it just didn't come their way. Yeah, the, the waves just didn't really show up, which was unfortunate because we would have loved to see both of them getting that heat total into that excellent range as well and really putting on a good battle of who can find the better nine. Can we find a 10 out here at Bells this week? But hmm. to see Philippe get it straight off the bat, I mean, to keep it under control, under pressure, and like you said, Bugs, that wave just continued offering him more and speed power flow he took it through yeah he smashed it well there's still plenty to come we've got the top five around the corner in what was just an unbelievable four heat day can you believe it
Thanks for staying with us for this edition of the WSL Post Show here on day seven of the event window. And what a day it was, Felipe Toledo celebrating his birthday in complete style and uh, moving on through to the semis. Big happy birthday to him and also to our mate Strider Wazaluski who's celebrating his 50th over there in Fiji. Oh, what a party that's going to be. Oh, wow, that's so good. Yeah, it would have been too much of a distraction here if it was uh, happening during the, the Rick Curl <laughs> Pro Bells Beach. But uh, an amazing day with, with so many big highlights. But we've got to reflect on the women's semi-final bracket. Uh, uh, we've got surfers chasing their first Bells titles, and then we've got, you know, Bells specialists chasing their fourth Bells win. And Courtney Conlog, you know, you've got to remember that she missed 2018. So she's on a, already a three-event winning spree here at Bells Beach. She's got the chance to get a four. That's huge. Oh, yeah. Her record out here is unbelievable. To think of the, the current crop that she's now competing in in the draw right now, those are many of the women that she's taken down over those last three appearances. That is really going to go in her favor. Yeah, Tyler Wright just looks so determined. In fact, both those competitors do in that top side of the draw, but Carissa Moore down low in that, that second semi-final. You'd like her chances against Brisa, but Brisa is the world number one for a reason. Here is the men's bracket again. Can't get enough of this huge matchup. Uh, big bounce back for the Australians who've been really groveling their way through the first uh, events of the season. Uh, Callum Robson, huge moment for him, Bug. So a couple of surfers chasing their first championship tour win here on finals day. And uh, obviously Felipe Toledo looking for his second Bells final. And uh, this time he's got a great chance of getting the big one. He's got a great chance, but he's got a little mountain to climb in, in, the, in the form of Ethan Ewing. So that's going to be an incredible semi-final. It sure is. Let's have a look at the Surfline forecaster and Bugs. I want you to look at these conditions for me, but I also want to, you to tell me who you think might have the edge with the conditions we are looking at for finals day. Well, cranking offshore Sunday, what's tomorrow? <laughs> That'll be Easter Sunday, mate. <laughs> And that's yeah. what we want to see. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be interesting, isn't it? We'll be down here bright and early. The big thing today, Shannon, was that tide. It played a huge part in the decision to get competition underway or not early on. It was a long hold. Uh, it was the right call because it kind of pulsed through this afternoon. Yeah, it was really good call. Um, that wind came up, but it wasn't too bad. As we take a look at that long-term forecast, it's really good to see that for tomorrow, Sunday, there's still those six to eight foot conditions. As long as the wind can be sort of favorable, I would see us running tomorrow morning just because we've only got a few hours of competition left. We're going to try and push it through before that tide peaks out in the afternoon. Yeah, Bugs, uh, you, you, you want to follow that forecast. It's very reliable, but here at Bells Beach, you've, you've just got to show up early and get eyes on it. If tomorrow, Easter Sunday, and the Easter bunnies come, never look a gift horse in the mouth. <laughs> yep, take the chocolates and run. Uh, but, yeah, it, it has been a, a magical day of competition. So much drama. I can't believe it was only the four heats, but it, it is going to set up an unbelievable showdown for the Bells title in its 59th edition. Uh, great men's challenges and also uh, a fantastic car so women going after the win here so uh let's get stuck into it tomorrow prediction shannon for you on the women's side oh my goodness i'm gonna say courtney conlog she's again had that tear and i think she's got so much hunger to need requal well, to make that mid-season cut i think that hunger is going to take her through to a victory well that would be the ultimate clutch performance uh bugs for you what about on the men's side well i guess uh I, I do think that the, the winner of that the semi-final with Philippe Toledo and Ethan Ewing, are just, uh, they're, they're just coming from that really strong side of the draw. Uh, Philippe Toledo beating John John, it's got to give him a, a bit of a spring in his step. Yeah, I think that's a, a good call. I, I think the winner's in that, that first semi-final too. Now it's time to dive into the top five for the day, and there was so many highlights, as I mentioned, and keep just absolutely ramming home. It was only four heats, and uh, yet... <laughs> One of the most dramatic afternoons of competition that we've had all year. The fans, they love a big weekend down here around Easter Bugs and they turned out in force today to watch the quarters unfold. They, they, they came early. They were here at 7 o'clock this morning and uh, they waited all day for and it was a worthwhile wait. Yeah, and the surfers were really appreciative of their commitment and just hanging out for, for the call to get competition underway. So a big shout out to all the fans that made the trip down to Bells Beach this year and we know that you're going to be here on finals day to bring it home. And then we, uh, we got stuck into it. The first quarterfinal heat saw Ethan Ewing just continue 
this aggressive approach on the rail bugs. Yeah, it's phenomenal. Uh, he's really coming into his own. He's getting stronger as the tournament progresses, and that's a good sign. He's going to have to. It's going to have to draw upon a peak performance tomorrow. Yeah, I loved watching this guy just uh, do his thing out here. You can tell that he's starting to really do his best surfing with the CT jersey on. And imagine two from the same family getting that bell. His mom, Helen Lambert, took it back in the 80s. And if Ethan Ewing can answer back and get that bell at home, that's going to be a really cool trophy case. It'll be a big uh, emotional victory. He's definitely looking uh, ultra inspired. And we'll see what form, kind of form he brings to finals day. John John Florence in a losing quarterfinal clash with Felipe Toledo still gave us amazing highlights. 8.43 for this wave. What about that first turn? Well, this is one of the biggest waves of the day. You, know, you, you can't underestimate how powerful this wave is, and it's power for power. And John John, it's, it's, uh, he didn't win the heat, but that is the most difficult thing you could ever imagine. Yeah, degree of difficulty, very insane on that last manoeuvre. He climbed on top of it. Quarterfinal number four brought fireworks in the finish. Italo Ferreira. And uh, he is a former Bells champ. He was the last left in the mix this afternoon. He was up against Jack Robinson. He would have really fancied his chances. Uh, he would have thought that he had it. I mean, it's their first CT matchup as well. So there's not that kind of remembrance to go back to for either of them on, okay, I had the edge here or there. Italo would have thought, hey, he's an Olympic gold medalist, a world champion, and a bell ringer. He's got Jack under control, but man, Jack came back and, and really took him down. Italo still thinks he had it. Uh, but Jack <laughs> Robinson, you know, I, I'm starting to see why maybe the judges gave Jack the nod with just that big turn on the outside section. It was a good size set wave, and he brought it home strong, Bugs. Yeah, it, it's unbelievable. It, this board looks so small, and it, yet it, it controls it so well in this heavy water. Yeah, it was amazing. Not sure who he was pointing to there, but he, he was definitely pointing to someone, it letting them know that he liked that ride. You know, it really, it, it reminded me of a warning moment. Yeah, a big shot across the bow there, celebrating with his coach, Matty Bemrose, who was buzzing. Italo was clearly frustrated. And, uh, you know, I, I think, again, you go back and you review those waves. It's a close heat that could have gone either way. This time, it's gone in Jack's favour. Yeah, it was a line ball decision, and uh, that, you know that's what I said. It was a it was a knock him down street fight. But this guy stole the show today, and he did it with one ride. Our top moment for the day, Felipe Toledo, birthday excellence, going near perfect on this one, Shannon. Oh, it was so close. Would have loved to see him walk away with a ten, but I gotta feel like he is happy with that. Look at how fast and how much power he is stringing together on this wave. I mean, it just stood up so perfectly for him. That would have been the coolest birthday gift as well to paddle out for his first wave. It wasn't like he went hunting for this thing for a while. It just opened up straight from the start. Well, he earned the gift. Uh, and it came in the way of that, that big number. I'm pretty sure he's, he's happy with how things panned out this afternoon. It's a good birthday for him, Bugs. What a, what a welcome back to the beach, a Brazilian birthday, and uh, no one celebrates like the Brazilians. However, Felipe won't be celebrating too hard tonight. It's gonna be a, a very mellow evening. There's still a couple of huge heats to come. He might be in both of them the way he's competing at the moment. But uh, yeah, a monster day competition. And, you know, again, we, we just got the best out of the conditions on offer today. We're on hold for a long time, but there really wasn't the, the consistency in the swell bugs and also uh, the steepness in the face. No, well, I mean, all day we waited for it. We had to go through a fairly high tide. It was a 1.8 metre tide. We got a full moon coming at Easter. And uh, there really would have been a, a pretty bad decision to go earlier. And we waited for that new swell to kick in, and it, it arrived. And uh, it's made for a really great little package tomorrow. Most definitely. Uh, Shannon, great to chat surfing with you uh, today. And Bugs, we'll see you. The bunny rabbit will be out bright and early tomorrow <laughs> morning, ready to wrap up an unbelievable year. It could be going down tomorrow. Make so sure you tune in bright and early. But for now, we'll leave you with the highlights. They're on. What a fantastic day. The crowd's starting to fill in here at Bells Beach once again. Ethan on the first wave and straight into it. Big hammer there. Ethan Ewing too strong in quarterfinal number one. He's on his way to the semifinals. Getting things started early to Lado, and he hammers it. A 
Unbelievable surfing. Here's the answer back. Felipe Toledo, just too strong. Callum Robson, he is heating up. Happy with that one. Here's Jack Robbo, and he finishes big on the inside. This copyrighted event broadcast is produced by the World Surf League for broadcast around the world and may not be retransmitted, reproduced, rebroadcast, or otherwise distributed or used in any form without the written consent of the World Surf League.